救いというかその結局この物語の中でそのまあレキっていうその灰羽の女の子がその救いを見出すみたいな物語であってそれに近いえと出来事っていうのはその僕の,そのまあその記憶の中にあるわけですねその時にえあ自分がこれがある種救いであったんだってこう思った時のそのえ気持ちというのがものすごくそのうん自分にとっては大きなものだったんでそれをこう,うまくえー、と自分の例えば苦しんでいた期間からその、えー、最後まであの救いこれが救いだったのかなって思える、えー、時までっていうのを例えばその。What sort of thoughts does this picture bring to mind? Angel, afterlife, religion, happiness, maybe even cliché. The symbolism in this picture runs deep. The halo and wings bring forth a very particular feeling and expectation. An expectation that is never truly met within the show. The series this picture is from has ties to all of these symbols. But because of the mystery and depth of the show, you could also say that this picture means none of these things. Today, we are going to take a look into a show that has intrigued me since the first time I saw it. A show that I have spent hours trying to unravel. A show that has cemented itself in my mind as one of the greats. Haibane Renmei. In this video, I will be analyzing Haibane Renmei in its entirety. So know that major spoilers are coming for the whole series. Don't worry, you'll be warned before I actually begin talking about major plot spoilers, which will be around discussing episode 5. So, if you want to stick around and see if you would be interested in watching the show until that point, see the link in the description to where you can stream the show. I will also be injecting a lot of my own opinion and findings into this video. This story will not provide the kind of experience where you have all the answers at the end, so a lot of what I will say is personal speculation. However, I will do my best at the end of this video to differentiate my speculation and what facts actually emerge in my closing statements. And finally, a disclaimer. This video will be delving into topics such as depression, suicide, religion, and some other issues about mental health and family dynamics. I will be pulling from my own experiences to contrast it with that of the characters. Viewer discretion is advised. Before I get into the meat of the video, I'm going to breeze over some general information about the show. Haibani Renmei was published as a doujin shi in 1998 by anime legend Yoshitoshi Abe. It was then adapted into a 13 episode anime in 2002. You may know the name Yoshitoshi Abe from his other works, including Serial Experiments Lane and Technolize. Haibani Renmei is categorized as a slice of life, mystery, psychological, Fantasy and drama. I am now going to read the official summary on my anime list about the show to give you an idea of the information we are given so I can come back to this later when delving into the mysteries of the show. Born from a cocoon in the village of Old Home, a young Haibane, a being with a halo and small gray wings, awakens to a world she does not understand without memories of her past. Named Raka, For the dream of falling she had while inside the cocoon, she soon becomes accustomed to life in the strange town. However, there are strict rules for the Haibane, such as being forbidden to leave the village or go near the wall surrounding it. These, along with the mysterious disappearances of their kind on their day of flight, begin to unsettle Raka and the others since they know almost nothing about their own kind. Haibane Renmei tells not only Raka's story, But also of those around her, as they live their lives with no memories of the past while trying to break free from their former pain and ultimately find salvation. I find what the summary does not say to be the most telling when it comes to why I find the show mysterious. It gives just enough of a plot synopsis to hook the viewer, but not enough to anchor the plot down to any particular details. When I showed this picture at the beginning, I asked what thoughts it invoked because just glancing at this picture, You would think this show is about angels living perhaps in the afterlife. But the summary does not address any of this. 
it immediately throws us off. It says the Haibani Raka is born from a cocoon in a village, not some heaven or afterlife, but a village. Raka is not resurrected, and it doesn't allude to her having died. She is born. It could be a sort of rebirth, but I have theories about that I'll get into later. This show could be categorized as a religious-themed experience, but this is not seeing the forest for the trees. The show's creator, Yoshitoshi Abe, addressed this himself in an interview with Animerica in 2003. He said, The way they look and the way they behave are those of a religious order, but they do not worship any particular deity. This suggests to me that the story of the Haibane is a religious and a spiritual one, but not necessarily a biblical one. I got a lot of this information from a fantastic post on my anime list that I will link to in the description if you are interested in a deeper dive into this topic. That link also goes into some of Abe's inspiration for Haibane, which I will touch on later, but this article really sums it up best and goes in depth into some of the symbolism I will talk about later on. On that subject, one thing that especially stands out is how often the writers emphasize the gray color of the Haibane's wings. This fact is highlighted over and over throughout the course of the show, so much so that the word haibane, written in kanji, literally translates to charcoal feathers. This has always struck me as unique because with most other shows I've ever watched, even mysteries, I've gleaned enough information with the summary and the first few episodes to know where the plot is going and what the show is really about. But after watching this show five times, I can confidently say that one can't easily extrapolate these aspects of the show given just the summary and the first five or six episodes. After watching hundreds of anime and thousands of episodes, I have never encountered a show that keeps me guessing so long into it and for so long after it's over. My point is that this summary, and the whole show actually, goes out of its way not to give too much away. It wants to be vague very much so in the same way that Abe's other works were vague. Abe uses this vagueness as an amazing storytelling vehicle. If you use mystery in the wrong way, it can feel like some campy Sherlock Holmes detective ripoff that's trying too hard but doesn't actually entertain you or make you think about the plot. <coughs> I wouldn't be mentioning this if that's all it was, but I am bringing it up because I think it's important to keep in mind when watching the show. Everything is so vague, and rather than it being for mystery's sake, it feels like it's not only a storytelling element, but an artistic choice. If you've watched Serial Experiments Lane, you'll probably understand the point I'm trying to get at. Because like that show, there is a lot, some say even an overuse, of imagery and symbolism. In my opinion, it was just fine. I like shows that use a lot of symbolism and make you figure it out yourself. But unlike Serial Experiments Lane, the show is not dripping with existentialism. Well, kind of. More on that later. Now that I have given an intro into the show and the creator and his habits, I'm going to go over the general plot of every episode and analyze what I think the symbolism means in the scope of the show, and try my best to explain the mystery behind the Haibane. From here on, there will be major plot spoilers. But if you want to watch up until the plot really starts to get good, aka you haven't decided if this is a good show yet worth watching, nothing will be truly spoiled until episode 5. I'll make sure to mark where the plot takes off so if you want to continue watching up until then, nothing major will be spoiled for you. The clips I am showing on the screen come from my personal copy of the show I bought, and the Funimation streaming versions are… old and have some quirks. I just figured I would mention that in case you go to watch it and the quality is awful. I'm not sure why Funimation can't use higher quality files that don't jump around when panning over backgrounds, but that's a gripe for another time. I will also be specifically discussing the English dub of the anime. I love dub and sub, but I just so happen to enjoy the dub of this anime more because of the low-key, more amateur voice acting, which aids to the overall feel of the show since there is not a lot of typical anime voice acting. This may be a detriment to some, but I personally think the more subdued performance helps the atmosphere and actually suits the characters very well, as I will point out later. 
every episode has three subtitles that give a lot of foreshadowing about the events to come. We start with Cocoon, Dream of Falling from the Sky, an old home. We open with a young girl hurtling down to Earth. from the sky. It's strange. Why am I not feeling scared now? Are you worried about me? Where am I? What is this? Everything here feels so soft and warm, but I'm anxious inside. I'm not afraid, but my heart feels cold. After the bird fails in trying to save the girl, it is whisked away and we get our first look at the town where the show takes place through the clouds as she plummets down. We then open in an old building and meet another one of the main characters, Reki. Reki finds the girl's cocoon and runs off to tell the others. Immediately, the atmosphere is set. There are happy-sounding strings playing, and the whole scene invokes this feeling of excitement. We are even told by Reki herself that this is big. Immediately, we know that this is very important. And the other Haibane are very excited. We are shown that there are also children Haibane, which, for reasons I will explain later, throws a wrench into a lot of the theories about the show. Once all the main cast of Haibane is gathered, they rejoice over the birth of a new Haibane, and we are briefly shown what their personalities are like by how they react to the cocoon. Reki is calm, but excited for a new Haibane to join them. Ku, the youngest of our main characters, can barely contain their excitement as they bounce around the room. They're very happy and genuine and say that they desperately hope they get a little sister. Kana is more subdued and, while happy, clearly wishes she could be at work. Hikari is kind of an airhead character and lets everyone walk all over her, but she has a good heart and is also very excited for the new Haibane. Nemu wishes she could go back to sleep. She loves to sleep, her whole personality is pretty much wanting to sleep. While observing the cocoon, Reki says something interesting that becomes plot important later. At any rate, why don't we at least try to clean up the room? Anybody who was born in a room full of junk like this. I'd feel sorry for. She then explains to Ku that all the Haibane are born in this manner. She says, just like you and I were. As they sit around the cocoon, Ku says she hears, Hey, I just heard it make a bloop sound. Uh huh? And then our protagonist is born. After she wakes up in a strange bed, the girl realizes she has no memories of anything, not even her own name. She notices her back is aching, but before she can investigate or even get out of bed, the other feathers enter the room and start bombarding her with questions. Then there's some exposition that just explains that no one remembers anything except for the dreams they had in the cocoon, and that everyone is named after the dream they had. Reki then gives the girl her name. Raka, since Raka means falling. They also give Raka her halo. It's red hot and seems to have been poured into this mold. Raka's halo won't stay on its own, so they have to give her a halo holder. Everyone leaves, and we are left with the real start of the mystery in the show. Whenever it's just Reki and Raka in a scene together, there is this distinct feeling of melancholy. As if at any moment, Reki will just start spilling all this information about what's going on. Reki obviously knows something, 
more than she is saying at any given time, and that is immediately obvious by the way she feeds small pieces of information to Raka. Reki is incredibly guarded, and although I didn't notice it the first time I watched the show, with that in mind when watching it now, it's so obvious that she is always holding something back. Raka suddenly falls ill, and Reki says her wings will be coming soon. While laying there on the bed, waiting for her wings to grow and her fever to break, Reki gives some more vital information. I'm sorry, the wings seem to be coming in faster than I had expected. I was hoping to explain everything to you before the fever broke out, but there wasn't any time. Does it hurt? Not exactly, but it feels like being pulled, like I'm going to get a cramp. I understand. It will sting a bit when the wingtips break the skin, then you'll run a high fever. But I promise you it will be gone by tomorrow. Mirror. You'd better not. It'll hurt more if you see it. I see. We're not human, are we? Nobody knows exactly what we are. If we're human or not. We call ourselves the Haibane, which means charcoal feathers. I want to go home. The Haibane are not allowed to go outside of town. It is our most sacred law. Besides, even if your family were somewhere in this world, they wouldn't recognize you if they saw you now. Why? Just as you cannot remember the world that you used to be in, there is nobody in this world who can remember you. It's the world that we live in. But why am I here? Why me? I'm just an ordinary girl. I'm sure that I was nothing special. We're all asking why. But nobody remembers anything. Then suddenly, Raka convulses. Her wings are breaking through. And here we get the first example of just how fast the genre and tone of this show can change. Remember back to the beginning of the episode, when everything was upbeat and happy, when watching this next scene. It hurts! <laughs> So you won't bite your tongue. This becomes a staple of the show. While there are many shows that change genres, this show does it in a discreet way I've never really experienced before. An easy example I can think of is Madoka Magica, a show about magical girls that turns into a show about existentialism and hope in the face of overwhelming despair. The genre change in Madoka happens around episode three and then stays with this new status quo throughout the show. Monica Magica executes this beautifully. But with High Bonnie Renmei, it's a very different sort of change. We will get these peaks into what seems to be the makings of a dark show, and then it will go right back to the slice of life aspect, and somehow it does it in such a way that, one, I'm not bored, and two, I don't feel whiplash from the change in pace and tone. I've never seen a show that so perfectly balances slice of life with psychological horror. And make no mistake, Haibani Renmei is absolutely a psychological horror, just not in the traditional sense. We hear Raka's thoughts as she worries that her body is changing into something else other than human. Then we get a great scene showing off how Raka's hair keeps getting attracted to her halo, which is a funny running joke throughout the series. And the episode ends on a very hopeful note, with Raka admiring her new wings we are left with this very symbolic picture of an angelic silhouette against a window. There are a lot of scenes in this show where someone is standing against a window. Seriously, like 10 or 11 scenes with this exact symbolism happening. But depending on the circumstances, like which character it is or the weather outside, a lot of foreshadowing about what's to come can be found. 
I will definitely come back to this when it happens. The episode opens, and we get a look at just how hard it is to get wings into a shirt and through the wing slits. It's little details like this that I really love this show for. We see Reki taking care of the children, and learn that her job as a haibane is to take care of all the children in Old Home. Raka leaves the house for the first time, and relishes in how beautiful Old Home is. She takes in the courtyard and buildings accompanied by this melancholic piano until she is interrupted by an adorable young feather trying to show Raka wing tricks. In this scene, we get to see a lot of Raka's personality. She's a bit airheaded, but also comes off as self-conscious. She gets along well with the children and always has this soft demeanor about her. This is one place I feel I can point out the voice acting. Raka especially, later on, has this perfectly matched, soft-spoken voice. I honestly just absolutely love all the vocal performances in this show, even some of the voices that used to grate on me at first. After all the times I've watched the show, I've really cemented these characters in my mind, and I couldn't imagine them being cast differently. During breakfast, the topic of names comes up, and we learn where Reki's name comes from. Your cake! That's just your favorite food, Shorta! No, it's not! I really did dream about it! You two, I told you to stop fighting. What about Reki? What's it mean? Huh? I, uh... Reki means little stones! What? Well, um, it's Reki, as in Gareki, meaning pebbles. I remember a moonlit night, and I was walking all alone down a pebble-laden path. Walking. And so the plot thickens. This show just loves to throw that random mystery at you. Then everyone decides to go to town to get Raka some clothes and show her around. We get some exposition telling us that Old Home used to be an old school dormitory that was abandoned and eventually became the Haibani Nest. But of course, no one knows when or why, which is the answer to most of the questions the characters are asked about anything to do with the Haibane or their past. They also mention that there is another home Haibane live in on the other side of town called Waste Factory, where everyone lives co-ed. Old Home only has the five main characters, the young feathers, and a house mother. On the road to town, we see a man in a cart with no wings or halo. Not everybody has wings like we do. Of course not. To be precise, the humans are letting us Hibernay live in their town. That's right. And it's supposed to be the Hibernay's obligation to only use things that humans no longer need. Really? So now we know Haibane can only use old things that people no longer need, and that extends to where they can work. For example, Hikari works in a bakery, and there are several in town, but she can only work at the oldest one. Very mysterious. Once at the thrift shop, we learn that the Haibane are not allowed to have money, so they pay with a special notebook called the Haibane Notebook. They work in town and then essentially use that work as credit to buy things. This is also the first time the Haibani Renmei is mentioned. What's that? This? It's the Haibane notebook of the Haibane Renmei. We use it in place of money. Oh, that's right. You don't have a notebook yet. Well, in that case, you can sign here. Oh, and leave a feather. Uh, sorry. Did I hurt you? I'm okay. Thank you. Oh, all right. Our extra special service. I also would just like to say that in this scene, directly after the last one, Raka looks like she has really strange short legs. <laughs> now we learn that today in town, everyone is holding market and that the toga must be there. Intrigued, Raka and the others go to Town Square, where we are introduced to the toga. Hooded figures with bandages over their mouths come through the great walls into the town, as one lone man comes to meet them. We learn that this man is the Haibani communicator. 
See? Those people they're bringing in the carts are the Toga. Look at those walls. This town is surrounded by walls on all sides. Both the Hyvene and the townspeople are forbidden to leave it. That's the way it's been since I've been here. The only exceptions are the Toga. They come from outside to trade with the town. And those standing next to them are the gatekeepers and the communicator from the Hibane Renme. Communicator? The residents of the town aren't allowed to speak with or touch the Toga. Likewise, the Toga would never come near us, and they are forbidden to use their voices while in our town. The only person who can speak with the Toga during their visits is the Hibane Renme communicator. They communicate with each other by making shapes with their hands, just like this. <laughs> but I'm just making it up. It's a language that only they can understand. In short, the Haibani Renmei serves as an intermediary for the trade between the Toga and the town. Part of the profit pays for things such as the utilities for Old Home, and to help support the Young Feathers. Oh. Just as a side note, as someone who used to want to be a sign language interpreter and lover of the deaf community and culture, I think it's really cool that there's this fictional sort of sign language in this show. I just think it's a really unique element. We then get a very tense scene, after Ku had to open her little mouth and draw attention to everyone, between Raka and the High Bonnie communicator, that seems to foreshadow something more sinister. Over and over in this show, crows are used for all sorts of symbolism. Kana absolutely hates crows and often comments on their pitch-black wings, which I find intriguing since one of the major symbols that constantly gets brought up and talked about throughout the show, and especially later in the show, is the color of the charcoal feather's wings. On the long walk back home, Raka asks again about what's beyond the walls and Nemu tells her that she's read every last book in the library and couldn't find a single clue as to what might be out there. So from the very beginning, the show makes it very clear that no one knows what's beyond the walls except for the Toga, whom, of course, can never speak to anyone in the town but the Haibane communicator. Raka wonders if the town she used to live in may be beyond those walls. Once arriving back home, Raka receives a letter asking her to come see the Haibane Renmei tomorrow and letting her know that she has been accepted as a Haibane. Raka goes back up to her room and finds Reki sitting alone, silently looking like she's deep in thought. Of course, as soon as she realized Raka is there, back up goes that wall. She retreats into herself and becomes the dependable Reki again. Raka tries to make tea for Reki and collapses because she didn't realize the emotional strain had made her so tired. And so Reki helps her to bed, where we get another look into the dynamic between Raka and Reki. <laughs> Try lying on your side for a while. It takes some getting used to. <clears throat> Is it staying? Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't slept. Reki, I'm fine, so please go to bed. I will when you're asleep. I already am. Good night, Raka. Good night, Reki. This episode opens with Raka wandering around Old Home, and, of course, having some hair discourse. <gasps> that was close. <sighs> What's wrong with this ring? Eventually, Raka notices some dark marks on the floor leading into a room, and after hearing a yell, Raka bursts into what we learn is Reki's room to find Reki sitting on the floor. 
Recky says she is such a restless sleeper that she rolled out of bed again. She explains that this is her room and painting studio, but refuses to let Raka see her paintings. When Raka tries to go into her paint room, Recky gets upset and tries to play it off as being a big mess, which is, of course, very interesting since it was so forced. After Raka leaves, Recky seems to be contemplating, and she says, the same dream again, which leads us to think that perhaps she wasn't restless in her sleep, more like she was thrashing around from a terrible nightmare she was having. Raka and Akari make their way to the temple, and Raka asks Hikari why she wanted to be the halo bearer in the first place. Hikari brushes it off, but is really obvious about it, which leads one to believe that perhaps her shenanigans is why Raka's hair sticks to her halo. We learn that the Haibane are not allowed to speak in the temple, and so are adorned with these bells on their wings and hands. I'm sorry, I forgot to tell you. We are forbidden from speaking inside the temple. This is their greeting. This is how you say yes. This is how you say no. The communicator is the only person who can speak, so let's go find him first. Mm. The Haibani communicator gives Raka her Haibani Renmei notebook. It guarantees your daily life. In return for what it provides, you are to work in this town. For yourself, for your dwelling place, and as an example to the young feathers, you must become a good Haibane. We are here if you need us. Come here when you are in trouble. Is there anything else? Raka goes back to old home, where she helps Reki and the house mother take care of the children. Raka goes into town with Ku to get some treats for the kids, and we get a look into Ku and Raka's dynamic, as well as who Ku is as a person. I helped to clean that cafe the other day, and the owner gave me some sugar cubes. You're working too? That's great. Mm -hmm. Because you're the newest charcoal feather, I've now become your senior but I'm still the smallest among the older feathers. Raka, I wanted to let you know, and please don't get mad about this, but I was first hoping that you would be like a little sister. After I thought about it for a while, I realized you'd be put into the young feathers group if you were any smaller than me. So what I'm trying to say is I'm glad you're bigger than me. That way we can still be together. That's a great way to think. I'm glad that I have a senior like you to guide me, Ku. <laughs> <laughs> hey, get out of here! How many times I have to tell you birds to leave? Kana hates the crows and she always calls them scavengers. But I don't think it's true. I think the crows really just want to be our friends. Huh? What we think is trash, the crows think of as food. I think they just want to be friends with us. They're asking for us to leave them our trash. I became friends with the cafe owner because I'm a charcoal feather and I can talk to him. That's why he gave me some sugar cubes. But the crows are pitch black and scary looking and they can only say caw caw. So people won't give them food and Kana chases them with a broomstick. It doesn't seem fair. I just wish we could talk with the crows. Hmm. Ku is a very open and caring person. It doesn't feel like she's holding anything back. In contrast to how Reki seems to be closed off, this scene with Raka feels so much more genuine. Raka and Ku go to the bakery to get treats from Hikari, where we finally learn what's up with Raka's frizzy hair. Oh, you don't have to act so modest, Hikari. Look at this. She came up with the idea for these all by herself. Try one. Be careful, they're hot. <gasps> Thank you so oh, much. Hikari, this is great. <laughs> She brought in an interesting frying pan the other day, so we experimented with it. Hikari! No, you didn't! <laughs> you caught me. So that's why you wanted to volunteer so much to be the ring bearer. That's a smart idea! Hikari! But you see, I just couldn't help trying it when I saw that mold. How could you even think of doing something like that? I washed it clean. That's beside the point! Not plot important, but it's just really funny. Back at old home, Reki talks to the house mother, and we get this scene. So today's carrot lesson was really aimed towards me. It wasn't for the kids. 
<laughs> well, I guess you've grown up enough to know not to run away. Give me a break. Obviously, whatever that was referring to weighs heavily on Reki's mind. And we end the episode with poor Raka doing her best to fix her hair troubles. Raka wakes from her dream, Takana reminding her she is to help her with her work today. We also see here that when a Haibane's halo is pulled, it pulls their head physically, which is interesting. I guess once it sticks, it really sticks. We get a lot more scenes about how Kana hates crows. She yells at them for getting into the trash and chases them with a broom. And Raka, of course, thinks this is mean and says that they should just take out the parts the crows would want to eat, which prompts Kana to give us this perspective. Damn, they've timed out the swing of my broom. Kana! Oh, sorry. That was mean. I know I closed this door tight yesterday. The crows must have figured out a way to unlock the door somehow. Wow, they're really smart. Don't act so impressed. Ugh! Just look at this mess they've made. Uh, I know. Well, why don't we just take out the things that the crows might like to eat? If you keep feeding them like that, they'll become dependent on us. Then how will they live on their own? Uh, oh. Just like the hibernate. The crows have rules. You can't spoil them. Come on, we better get moving. Oh. The birds are the only creatures that are allowed to go beyond the walls in this town. If we continue to feed them, we create a place where they can survive without any struggle. In the end, they'll decide to only inhabit this town, and will probably never fly free on their own again. And they might seem to be happy here, but it's just sad. Mm. Mm. Don't you give me that wistful look! I personally don't like the reasoning. If it were me, I'd feed the damn birds, but I see what sort of philosophical thing this scene is trying to get at, so whatever. Of course, this is another symbolic look into the lives of the Haibane. The crows almost always are symbols that relate to the Haibane's dilemma. A lot of the time, Raka even seems to be envious of the crows being that they're the only living creatures in the town that can go outside the walls and do whatever they please. Even the toga can't come and go as they please, since they can only come to trade or garden, I guess. I mean, we only ever see them trading stuff with the high bonnet communicator or gardening at the temple. I bet they would make good pickles. We see how passionate Kana is about fixing clocks, and Raka helps her with her work. On the way home, Kana and Raka talk about their lost memories. I think I can smell the river. Hmm. Maybe I've seen scenery like this at one time somewhere before. There you go, at it again. But this time I know just what you mean. So, do you remember anything? Hmm. Funny, isn't it? 
I can remember things like how to talk or how to ride a bike, but nothing else. Hmm, what is it? I think I remember that I used to sing whenever I was feeling like this. So I just thought now it'd be nice if I could remember a song. <laughs> This is the cutoff point. If you've watched this far and you want to watch the show for yourself, I would recommend you should stop watching now and watch this once you see the show for yourself. In this episode, it's Raka's turn to try helping out the library with Nemu. While helping Nemu, Raka learns that all these books are from the Toga, so every one of them was written by someone that once lived outside the walls. It is not made clear whether or not the books are still being written or if they are still all ancient, but from what I gather, it does not seem to me that any of these books are new. They talk about how they all have to get extensive repairs, which leads me to believe that outside the walls, it's a desolate wasteland where the Toga just bring back whatever they find. There are even some books they have that are so old that they petrified into rocks. Nemu's coworker, Sumika, says that she too once searched the whole library for a book about what's beyond the walls showing that even the other human villagers of this town wonder about the outside. I'm sorry. Thank you for helping me again. Oh, it's supposed to be my job to begin with. But what were you reading that held your interest so much? Oh, it was nothing very special. I just wondered if I could find a book that could tell me what's outside this town. Ah, I know what you mean. I looked everywhere for a book like that a long time ago. Really? Did you find it? No, nope, not at all. Oh. I guess that's to be expected. I guess I could tell you, I once thought about going out beyond the walls. Eh? I wanted to find the beginning of the world. The beginning of the world? The way that this town exists as it is now is because someone first began by building it. So along the same line, no matter how wide the world is, I think there's a beginning to it somewhere. I wanted to find it. Of course I couldn't go, because my life here is so much happier than chasing that dream. <laughs> <laughs> well, a dream is only beautiful because it remains a dream. But still, I wonder about it once in a while. <sighs> That's why life is so difficult. Uh, oh, oh no! I feel like this episode and this scene is really important because up until now, the villagers and the High Bane are so distinct. This gives a commonality between the two of them and makes them feel more like real characters rather than just the villagers that let us live here. At the end of the day, Raka finds out that Nemu is working on a book to give her co-worker Sumika as a gift. Yet only four more days. Huh? I meant Sumika. I was making her a gift, but there's no time to finish it. What is it? Knitting something? It's a secret. Hmm? I can help if you tell me what it is. It's somewhat embarrassing. Well, um, here's a hint. The beginning of the world. Huh? There was a book with that title in the library a long time ago, but it's discarded now. An old and crumbling book. Only the first few pages were legible. Sumika and I racked our brains to come up with the rest of the story. And then? That's the only hint. What? Reki. Reki! Raka and Nimu then become distracted by seeing Reki in town and follow her. They see a confrontation happen between Reki and some other Haibane. Oh, she just needed some gas for her scooter. Mm. See, a 
told you, it's just wrecking. What are you doing here? Kyoko! This is gonna be classic. <laughs> what was that for? Quit smoking, you stupid girl. Stop riding that bike. You're the one who's stupid. I have permission from town. It's perfectly legal for me to ride it. <laughs> Obviously, Reki has a past with these guys, so Nemu explains. There's a place called Abandoned Factory in the East District. It's also a nest for the Hibane. And lucky for them, it's co-ed. Really? That boy with the cap is one of the Haibane from Abandoned Factory? Yes, and one thing led to another with those two. What kind of things? Back then in Old Home, there were only Reki, the children, and me. And Reki was, well, troubled and a bit more rebellious. Oh. Things led to a big fight between us, and Reki ran away. Later on, I had heard that she had actually run away with that boy we saw. Oh, wow. That sounds so cool. Don't you follow in her footsteps. Because of what they did, neither one is allowed to go into each other's district. Oh. <sighs> I don't think having boys around would be too bad. But I don't like the ones in Abandoned Factory. They're so rowdy. We learn Reki ran away with that guy that was giving her flack for smoking, which Reki still feels really strongly about. Seeing how she reacted to it being brought up in this last episode by the house mother, it seems Reki still has a lot of negative feelings towards the incident, and it still deeply affects her. The next scene, we see Raka standing outside under the moonlight again, contemplating about her past. In my memories, there exists another version of myself. Nemo and the others said it isn't so. But I can't quite shake off the feeling from my mind that maybe my parents and the town I used to live in still exist somewhere. I wonder if this sense of confusion will disappear when my wings have completely become a part of my body. Here, everyone, even someone as little as Ku has a job, and has become a self-sufficient part of this world. Yet the truth is that everybody is mutually supporting each other in ways that are not apparent to the eyes. It's perfectly natural. But I didn't realize it until now. I wonder if I deserve to be as happy as I am. This scene is the first hint we get towards Raka's inner issues. Statements like, Do I deserve to be this happy? is heavy foreshadowing to the spiral her life takes in the coming episodes. Raka goes to the library again and tells Nemu she's researching the beginning of the world and we get a flashback into Nemu's past, where we learn what was written in the book Nemu and Sumika found that was too old to fully decipher. So what's she studying so intently? It's a secret. Just leave her alone for now. Oh? When I think about it, you were acting just like her when you first started working here. Was I? In the beginning of the world, there was nothing but a dark mist called the nothingness. And then God appeared. By merely being there, he brought, um, let me see, um, light into the nothingness. When God... something... glowing over his head, it... it became the sun. It's hopeless. This book is too damaged to read. Oh well. We'll just have to come up with the rest by ourselves. Nemu seemed to be deeply affected by not being able to figure out the answers. She also desperately seemed to want to know what was outside the walls, just like Sumika and Raka. Raka helps Nemu come up with an ending to her book, which is called 
the beginning of the world. Nemu decided that she wanted to come up with her own answer for her and her friend, Sumika. And damn it, <laughs> that's so sweet. I love this part of the show. It gives me those good, sweet feels. The next scene focuses on Ku. Thanks a lot. Yeah, see you later. Uh, oh, yeah. Goodbye. All right. You take it easy, boy. Uh, here you go. Bye-bye. Cool. Oh, Raka. What are you doing? Hmm? Just saying goodbye. Saying goodbye? I said <gasps> no. Come on, it's okay. No way. This is heavy foreshadowing to something bad that's going to happen. The next day, Raka and Nemu ride into town together and we get to hear what Nemu's book says. I really hope that Sumika will like it. Mm. If she thinks it's stupid, it's gonna be all your fault. What? Why? Well, because I collaborated with you. Your name is now on the cover too. Huh? It's too late for that. No, it's not that, but is it okay? <sighs> well, you're jointly responsible. Better be prepared. Nemu, I'm very happy. I hope Sumika will be too. How can she not be? <laughs> when God... something... glowing over his head... When God took into his hand the halo glowing over his head and held it high, it became the sun. God waved his staff, and the nothingness was ripped into two, one part forming the sky, and the other, the land. However, his hand was not straight, thus creating mountains and valleys. God said, it was a mistake, but it's just as well. When God drew pictures on the land, grass and trees grew, and birds and animals came to life. God then envisioned creatures that looked almost like himself. But these creatures were too similar to himself, and that gave him concern. So he colored their wings charcoal gray and made holes on their halos and named them Hibane. Then he tucked them away in the back of his mind. After that, God started over and created human beings that did not have wings or halos. And this time, he was satisfied with his creation. Completely content. God. God, despite his omnipotence, fell asleep. The Haibane, who were destined to be erased, were able to escape from his mind. When God awoke, the Haibane were already floating in the sky. However, ever tolerant of mistakes, even his own, God decided to let the charcoal feathers in their tiny world be. So that is why the town of Guri is still floating somewhere today. Somewhere that is neither on the land nor the sea. I seriously doubt this is the actual lore of the show. It seems pretty obvious to me that this is supposed to just be what Nemu made up, but it is a beautiful story. Nonetheless. Raka is searching for her own room so she can move out of the guest room. Every room she looks at is no good. She comes across Ku while searching, and she gives Raka her winter jacket and talks about how winter is almost here. Ku writes some recommendations for rooms and says she has to be on her way since she has a lot to do today. Found a good room yet? Uh, no. They're all 
pretty much just full of dust, so every room that I see, I can't tell if it's good or not. I gotta go now. Huh? But it's almost time for breakfast. Yeah, but I've got a lot of things to do today. <sighs> Ku's halo flickering brings several thoughts to mind. Is she sick? Maybe Haibane only live for a certain amount of time. Maybe they eventually lose their halo. I'm sure at this time, Raka is wondering the same things. But she tries to put it out of her mind, and she doesn't bring it up to anyone, although it's more than clear that she can't stop thinking and worrying about Ku. Everyone starts to gather because they hear the bell in the courtyard ringing. Kana finally fixed the broken bell but it also never stops ringing. This comes up as a plot point later. Raka runs off to help Kana shut down the bell, and we get this important bit of exposition about Ku. That's Ku's, isn't it? Oh, mm-hmm. If she gave it to you, then she finally gave up, I guess. What do you mean? Well, that's the first thing she got after arriving here. She always hated being treated like a kid and wanted to have clothes that were the same size as ours but she could never fit into them. Is it okay? Should I keep it? She no longer has to pretend to be what she isn't anymore. Huh? <sighs> Ku used to want to copy everything that we did. Really? She tried to ride Reki's scooter and ended up crashing into a utility pole. She got dizzy wearing Hikari's glasses and fell down the stairs. Ku's just a little kid getting into trouble all the time. But maybe she's grown up in her own way. I guess I have to grow up too. Raka now goes to the room that Ku recommended she check out and finds Ku waiting for her there. This next scene is the most telling scene of all. All of the foreshadowing from the last two episodes comes together right now, at this moment. Wow! For some reason, this room feels familiar. That's because... Uh, this is the room where you were born. I was born in here? The cocoon room. We found your gigantic cocoon exactly where you're standing right now. Yes. I seem to remember a little. I remember... something. I remembered mine a bit, too. It felt right, so I made it into my own room. How about this one? Do you like it? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, where have you been all this time? Brecky was very mad because you asked her to make hotcakes and then you didn't show up. <laughs> I asked her to pack up a breakfast for me. And for you, too. Here. Uh, thank you. That's right. I almost forgot I missed breakfast, too. You know, Recky was very mad. <laughs> <laughs> Notice the sudden change in weather. We are about to get another one of those symbols I mentioned earlier in the video of the angelic figure standing in front of a window. But this time, instead of beautiful sunlight outlining their angelic body, it's dark and gloomy outside, and Ku is turned away. Inside my mind, there's a beautiful cup. A very beautiful, clear cup. And tiny drops kept falling into it. Drip, drip, drip. Slowly but steadily, every day. And today, I felt that the cup had finally become completely full. because you gave me some of those drops.
Raka, thank you. The cup Ku speaks of being in her mind seems to be a metaphor for fulfillment. This information is very important for many of the theories about the show. This sets up the foundation for the mystery of the show. At this moment, it's easy to theorize that perhaps when people die, they come to this world and live a peaceful life as a haibane until they find true fulfillment in their lives. Maybe they couldn't find happiness when they were alive, and so in the afterlife, they are given a chance to live out a simple life they could have never had. There are a few factors that make it hard to think that this is 100% one of the answers. Like how there's regular humans in the town, which makes me ask, why are there Haibane and humans here? Is this town on Earth? Is everyone dead but the Haibane are special somehow? People live in this town. They are born as shown by Nemu's pregnant co-worker, so that makes it seem like it's a normal town. These questions are why I decided to make this video, because it's so hard to answer them all once you have all the context. One answer is given and five more pop up. It always feels like there's something more right beneath the surface. Raka goes to see Reki and says she feels there's something off about Ku, but Reki writes her off, saying this sort of weather always makes people feel on edge. Raka is again questioning the walls. Everybody feels depressed when the weather's like this, or they become obsessed with the idea that something bad is going to happen. I'm not sure. You can keep this room for a while longer, if you're not ready to move out yet. No, it's not that. Listen, why is this town surrounded by walls? Why is it? I don't know for sure. It's probably because this is a protected place. Protected? Protected from what? From everything that's not good. Or maybe it protects us from everything we're not supposed to know. That's not- <laughs> failure? It struck somewhere nearby. Stay put. There's a flashlight somewhere in here. Once the power goes out, Raka sees a crow outside and runs to see where it's flying. She looks over into the woods and sees a bright light shooting up into the sky. <laughs> Raka, where are you going? In the western woods, the birds. Mm, they must have been surprised as well. It seems like they were trying to tell me something. Why don't you go back and dry yourself? You'll catch a cold. I'll go check on the kids. Stay in your room. I have no idea why Raka doesn't tell Reki about the light right then. But it's probably just because plot. But yeah, she should have told Reki about the light. <laughs> Everyone is concerned Ku hasn't come back. Raka says she's going to look for Ku and runs outside. Reki comes to help. And now Raka decides to tell Reki about what she saw in the forest. Notice the immediate tone change in this scene when the western woods are mentioned. This is another example of the excellent use of tone changing in the show. Maybe Ku didn't go into town. Hmm? This morning, she asked you to pack her a lunch, right? Oh, yeah. And she had a water bottle. 
To me, it looked like she was getting ready to go. To go? To go where? Probably the Western Woods. It can't be. She wouldn't have done that. The walls are most powerful in the Western Woods. Ku knows how dangerous it is to go. There's no way. Who's gone to the Western Woods? Huh? I really wasn't trying to eavesdrop, but the generator's fuse blew, so I was trying to use the one in the clock tower. And I heard you say... Well, we were just saying she might have, because she's late to come back here. But what if she really did go there? Then that means that... Kana! We don't know anything for sure. What's that? What do you mean? Raka, I know you've never been to the Western Woods. So what makes you think that she went there? When the rain got started, the birds went crazy in the Western Woods, as if trying to tell me something. That was because of the rain. But then, I saw a light there for a moment. Like lightning? Mm-mm. -mm. It was coming out of the woods and heading towards the sky. You saw it? Are you sure? You really saw it? I think. But it was quickly hidden by the clouds. You're lying! Uh, Kana! I refuse to believe that happened! It just can't! I didn't want to believe it either. But it seems that Ku might have really left all of us. What? The time when a Haibane goes outside the walls on their day of flight. After hearing Ku's day of flight may have come, all the Haibane decide to go see if they can find her in the woods. The next scene will be a little lengthy, but I feel like it explains what's happening much better than a few sentence summary from me could. If there's still time, I want to see her too. We all want to see her. But think, if you go into those woods without knowing where you are, you will never come out again. We need to have a point of reference. What's that? Kana, the bell on the clock tower. What? Start the bell. The tower's generator works, right? Then you can keep the bell ringing, can't you? That's right! <clears throat> Raka. Please, Reki. I know that I'll regret it forever if I don't do anything right now. So, bring three more raincoats or four more. All right, then. We'll all go together. But promise me you will not go near the walls, no matter what. The legend goes that there are ancient ruins in the heart of the woods, and that a charcoal feather is led there on his or her day of flight. The day of flight is the time where a high bunny leaves the nest to go beyond the walls. There is no way of telling when that day will come, or to whom. He or she just disappears one day without warning. No one knows why such things happen. A charcoal feather who is about to leave the nest never speaks of it to others. Besides, we haven't had any days of flight for the past few years, mainly because for a long time there weren't any new cocoons appearing, so nobody has left the nest for quite a while. Perhaps we were all forgetting, or hoping that we could forget, that there may come a day when we have to say goodbye to one of us, like today. Drops. Raka, thank you. Cool. Raka finds Ku's halo. There is now no doubt that Ku took her day of flight. Raka, 
is deeply affected by this. And this is the moment that defines who Raka is about to become. This whole day of flight phenomenon seems to me to be an allegory for how religious individuals feel when their loved ones die and go into the afterlife. Christianity, Islam, Jehovah's Witnesses, all have afterlives, aka heaven or hell. And other religions such as Hinduism, Buddhism, and Sikhism all have a belief involving reincarnation or merging with the universe after a certain point. Obviously, that's an insane oversimplification. And if anyone has more insight into these religions regarding this scene, please comment and tell me about it because I find it fascinating. What I'm getting at is this specific part of the show is playing off that feeling. Your loved one dies, or in this case, takes the day of flight. And while it's very sad, you have to try and be happy so your loved one can move on. This gets brought up more in depth later on. I am not a religious individual, but growing up around religion and being from the South where religion is what people eat, breathe, and live, I can absolutely sympathize with the conflicting feelings of loss and happiness for your loved one to have moved on from this mortal suffering. While trekking back through the woods, we see several shots of ancient ruins showing that perhaps this is a process that has happened countless times in these ancient woods. The episode ends with a statement from Reki. Everybody, in the end, everybody leaves me. We open on Raka, looking very depressed. She looks out the window and sees Kana and Ikari playing with the young feathers. And seeing that amount of happiness makes Raka feel overwhelmed with emotion. After holding back her tears, Raka says, I can't. I shouldn't cry. Which leads me back to my point about the last episode. In this episode, we see Raka spiral into guilt over her conflicting feelings about Ku's day of flight. This is perfectly demonstrated in the following scene. Good morning, Ku. It's already been a month since you left. Winter has finally come to this little town. But thanks to your advice, I didn't catch a cold. How are you doing, Ku? So what's it like where you are now? What do you do there? I hope people there are as nice as those in the town of Goody. In case you're wondering, everybody here at Old Home is doing fine. And I'm... <laughs> Sorry, but I can't congratulate you like everybody else. I wanted to be with you much longer. I wanted to go shopping with you, and eat with you, and talk about a lot of things with you. There were a lot more things that I wanted you to teach me. All the subtleties in this scene really hit home for me. Those of you watching who have lost a loved one, I'm sure you can relate as well. After my brother died, we went to his house to collect his things, and I remember marveling at how everything was exactly the same. 
like he would walk through the front door at any moment. But everything was also empty and cold at the same time. His absence was felt everywhere, in the quietness of the house, in the dust collecting on the counters from no one being there in weeks. It's a sobering moment to realize they're really gone. It's in moments like this that it becomes impossible to live in denial about someone being gone. After we cleaned out my brother's things, it really cemented his death for me. Here, I think Raka is feeling very similar feelings with the added pressure of her not being able to congratulate Ku like everyone else, hearkening back to the points I mentioned before. When Raka sees the frogs Ku made and knocks over her frog, I think this is a symbol for Raka's inner turmoil at the moment. I can only imagine the sorts of feelings that are supposed to be going through Raka's head are anguish and longing to know the answers. At this moment, Raka has the same amount of information that we, the audience, do. She doesn't understand what the day of flight really means. She doesn't understand the concept of death really either, because no one has ever explained it to her. Raka right now is like a child who doesn't really understand why she's lost someone. And I can only imagine that sort of confusion and pain is distinctly terrible and unique. Raka now notices that she has a dark spot on her feathers. After she plucks it out, she pretty much ignores it and goes into town. Here, we get a scene with the barkeeper. Hey, I see a lot of you these days. Is that all you want? You know, I haven't seen that kid around. Know him? That boy, he's just a little shorter than you. Cool. Ah, that's it. I didn't remember his name. Oh, she's a girl. Now I feel bad. I kept calling her boy. Tell her I'm sorry. Ku isn't here anymore. What? Then she's disappeared? Well, I guess that's how it always ends up with all you Hibernae. I understand. So, this is to go, isn't it? Oh, don't worry. It's on me. Save that for when you come here to have a big full course dinner. But I... Here you go. Have some more coffee. That's how it always goes with you, Haibane. Even the villagers find this normal in this town, giving evidence that this has been happening for countless years. That is also evident just by how normal the Haibane are to the town and the frequent comments about how the Haibane have just always been here when they're referring to Old Home. And the way the barkeep refuses to let Raka pay, if you look closely at how she reacts, it seems that she feels guilty. This is very important. Real quick, before the next scene, I want to point out something I find hilarious. This boy Haibane that has a history with Reki, his name is Shioko but everyone calls him Hiyoko to make fun of him, and every single person does it throughout the whole show. Not one person or Haibane calls this poor guy by his real name, and I find it so hilarious. You're Hiyoko. Not Hiyoko, it's Shoko. It means ice lake. Hiyoko means baby chicken. It doesn't matter. Now we get our first real scene with the boy Haibane that was talking to Reki a couple episodes ago. Stop riding that bike! He comes up to Raka and asks if she saw a light go up into the sky from the western forest. Listen, do you remember seeing that light that came out of the western woods? You know, about a month ago when the storm came? My friend told me something. The light only shows up when a Haibane is gone, when they're supposed to go beyond the walls. But everybody's still around at our factory. So we thought maybe it was someone from your rundown. Oops. Sorry, I meant to say old home. Mm. So tell me, was it Reki? Phew. That's good. I was worried. Oh, um, don't tell anybody that I asked, especially... Huh? Uh, What do you mean saying that's good? Just lost a close friend. 
Hey, wait! After running off upset, Raka notices Ku's nameplate is gone. Yet another painful reminder for her. The crows seem to want her attention, but she ignores them and goes inside. There's a brief scene where the other high bonnet are discussing how Raka seems really depressed and they aren't sure how to help. We also get some insight into how the others are dealing with Ku's departure. Kana! Overcooked! It's cooked fine. No, it's not. Where's Raka? I went to get her, but she wasn't there. She doesn't eat with us much anymore, does she? Hmm, maybe she's on a diet. Kana? I was only joking. I heard that she likes to go into town more often to eat these days. Alone? Maybe she wants to be left alone. She was the most depressed out of all of us when Ku left. Did you know? Raka's been cleaning up Ku's room all this time. Oh, so Raka did it too? Kana, you went to Ku's room too? Just one time. I've accepted it. I know Ku isn't with us anymore. I wonder if Raka just can't accept it. You know, I thought maybe we should leave her alone until she's ready to let it go. Hmm. But she has to find closure to this event sometime. Reki talks about helping Raka find closure to this event sometime, which is ironic considering Reki's whole deal is about how she can't find closure to her own trauma. But that's a tangent for later in the video. We see Raka back in her room, where she notices more dark spots on her wings. After some depression-induced bad ideas, she decides that she should cut the spots off with scissors. This is not only something that I find interesting because it seems like Abe has a pretty good idea of what it's like to feel like that, but it also shows just how far gone Raka is into her deep depression over Ku, as you will see in the coming scenes. But back to Abe and how he wrote this. One of the standout parts of the show for me is how I can really feel Raka's feelings. It's not easy to make 2D animated characters feel real, but from my own experiences, I can sympathize with Raka and Reki and the other characters too, with their struggles to an extent. I've watched shows where the main character is depressed or just sad or whatever it may be, but I've never seen it executed so well with such subtlety. I think that this is the perfect example of you don't have to be flashy and make your characters have a mental breakdown to show they're going through it. For me, less is more in situations like these. Raka goes down to see everyone, and they sort of can tell something's off, but mostly everyone is oblivious. I will add one other ridiculous point. You know how Raka didn't mention the light she saw immediately to Reki? Reki now straight up sees the black shit growing on Raka's wings and acts like it's nothing weird, even though this happens not a minute later. There aren't that many wonky scenes like this, but since there aren't, they are really easy for me to point out. Raka tries to play off her wings looking weird to her not having a bed, and so Nemu suggests Raka take Ku's bed. And then that's when Reki notices the black spots and becomes concerned. Raka runs back to her room, and Reki finds her there, surrounded by the feathers she's cut off her wings. But no matter how much Raka cuts off, more black spots appear. There is this intense scene where Reki is giving Raka this understanding, pitying look. Raka seems not to know what this look means, but to me, it says, I've been where you are, and I'm so sorry. Raka then tries to grab the scissors, either in her shame to cut off the dark spots, or perhaps to harm herself. In the dark mental place she finds herself in now, I have no doubt that she would be capable of doing something rash like that. But of course, there's no concrete proof, so this scene could be none of those things. This is one of the few scenes in the show where I'm not sure how I really should interpret it. So I'd love to hear what you think about it in the comments if you have any other ideas. Reki holds Raka and just tries to be there for her as Raka breaks down. Overwhelmed by the day's events and all the emotions she's been trying to keep inside, 
She says the black spots keep spreading, and she's scared. She asks if she's sick, but Reki says she isn't. She tells Raka she has nothing to be blamed for. It stings. It stings because you cut off your feathers. Just rinse them with cold water when you wake up tomorrow morning. That should make the black seem less noticeable. It's medicine, isn't it? So I am sick. I was right. This is just a dye collected from an elderly tree. The legend says it can blind the eyes of the evil. An elderly tree? A snow scale tree, I guess. They grow only near the walls and are named elderly trees because their trunks are very much twisted. But you stay away from the walls no matter what, okay? It's dangerous. Reki, why do you have such special medicine? How do you know about these things? Uh. This town exists for the Haibane. The walls are there to protect us. A good Haibane lives here happily and goes beyond the walls when their time comes. But once in a while, a Haibane is born who cannot be blessed by the town. A charcoal feather who cannot remember anything about their dream in the cocoon. The day of flight never comes to him or her. For such an unblessed Haibane, the town becomes a cage which offers no escape. This Haibane is declared to be Sinbound. So am I? No, absolutely not. I'm the one who first found your cocoon, and I'm the one who rinsed the blood out of your wings. Your feathers were beautiful charcoal gray when you were born. You're a good charcoal feather. You're not like I am. Reki, you don't have it. <laughs> the wings that broke out from my back had black spotted feathers. I was sin-bound from the very beginning. I could hardly remember the dream I had in the cocoon. Because of the black feathers, everybody was afraid of me. I was an outcast. Even Nemu avoided me when I was a newborn. If it weren't for Kudamori who protected me, I would have been all alone to this day. Kudamori? Beautiful. Yeah. She was like a mother to the kids and a good mentor to Nemu and myself. And despite her delicate health, she helped me by going to the heart of the forest to collect the medicine from the elderly tree. She's the one who decorated the guest room as it is now, so she, Nemu, and I could live there together. Kudamori wasn't afraid at all to be near me. She was always there by my side, not out of pity. She was just there for me when I needed her. She was a good person. But Reki, I think you're a good Haibane too. As a side note, in this scene, I think it's interesting that these elderly trees have twisted trunks, and also the glass container the medicine in is twisted. I think that is a cool detail, if that's supposed to mean that the liquid literally twists anything it's contained in. And if that is the case, the world of Haibani Renmei seems to have a lot more supernatural stuff going on than it shows. We get a few more answers from this scene with Reki. We learn about Haibane who can't take their day of flight. Those who are sin-bound. If you go back to the heaven or afterlife allegory, this would be hell or purgatory. Haibane who can't take the day of flight are destined to stay behind, grow old, and die. Reki reveals she is sin-bound and has been since she was born from her cocoon. We see that Reki has also lost someone special to her in the same way Raka lost Ku. From here on, the parallels between Reki and Raka continue to stack up until Reki almost seems like a literary foil for Raka. And this only becomes more apparent as the show goes on. Notice also in this scene, we get another symbolic look at the angel in front of the window. Except this time, it focuses on the shadow being cast by the window. To me, signifying how Reki is sin-bound. A dark shadow leering over Reki that can't be seen. 
Whatever you might think, I'm still a sinner. Five years ago, Kudomori left us. I didn't know anything about the day of flight, so I thought that she had abandoned me. I was so depressed that Nemu became concerned for me, so she did some research at the library on the old legend. She told me about the day of flight, but I didn't believe it. I had become too emotionally blinded. I hated a lot of things, and I think I said many terrible things to Nemu. I ran away from old home, but I kept repeating the same mistakes at the place I ran away to. In the end, I was caught by the community watch, and eventually punished by the Haibani Renmei as well. But you, Raka, haven't done anything to be punished for. You've done nothing at all. So I know in my heart, this must be some kind of a mistake. It'll be gone in no time. Reki, you don't remember your dream in the cocoon? Not completely. I've been drawing pictures and pictures of it, trying to remember. Since I came here, I've been haunted by nightmares. In my dreams, it's a very cold night, and there's a red moon in the sky. I'm all alone, just walking on a stone-laden path. Then something happens there. I can't remember what it was, but it's something very horrible. Every time it happens, I scream myself awake. Always the same dream. I don't understand at all. Why are there good Hibane and cursed ones? Why was I born, Sinbound? We get a lot of insight here. We learn what happened to Reki, although we don't get any details yet. We learn Reki is Sinbound, pretty much because she can't remember her dream in the cocoon. I think this is a very important point because it illustrates how in this world, you don't become sinbound or get left behind without a day of flight because you're bad. It can be completely out of your control. Like how Reki can't remember her dream. This is not really in her control, although there are points later I will talk about that can contradict this. It seems to me that the takeaway is supposed to be that these things can't be controlled all the time. It's not a punishment for Reki's wrongdoings. It's not something that only happens to bad people. Actually, all the Haibane are standout people who, despite some minor personal conflicts, never do any bad things. I have a feeling that whatever the Haibane are, whether it's reincarnations of people or just a straight up afterlife or something completely different, it doesn't seem like murderers and bad people become Haibane. Of course, it could be that the Haibane we are being shown in this show just so happen to all be good. But of course, that's just something we'll never know, since this is all the media of the series we have to go off of. After that information dump from Reki, Raka seems to feel even worse. Raka has a revelation about this in the next scene. <sighs> Until now. I had thought that this town was a paradise to live in, yet, despite everyone's caring and compassionate hearts and willingness to do their best for each other, sad things still happen. Some suffer from the curses given to them. What are the Haibane? Because of the conversation Raka has with Reki, she begins to really question what the Haibane are, seriously, for the first time. At the very beginning of this video, I talk briefly about the other famous works by this author, Serial Experiments Lane. I said that this show is not like Lane because it's not all just a big existential crisis-inducing mindfuck. Sort of. Here is what I meant. At this point, it's pretty obvious Raka is starting to have an existential crisis about who she really is. No one has answers for her, who she is, who the Haibane are, something as simple as her own name. Earlier, I made this distinction from Serial Experiments Lane because in Haibani Renmei, the show's main theme doesn't seem to be the characters going through an existential crisis. It just comes into play now. 
and in two or three episodes, the focus is shifted to other things. Here we get the first episode with only one title, The Bird. We open on Raka washing the medicine out of her wings. She seems to have things weighing heavily on her mind until she hears a knock at the door. Kana informs her that they are all going into Ku's room to divvy up her belongings like they talked about in the last episode. Do you like the wing covers? I'm so glad. Every one of us will take one of Ku's belongings to remember her by. Raka, how about the bed? Do you want anything else? Just those. Mm -hmm. Coming through. And there. <sighs> wow, it's cold. Good thing you got yourself a proper bed before it starts to snow. Right? How are your wings doing? Do I have to keep using the medicine? And keep hiding my wings forever? The wall's power to protect us weakens in the wintertime, so we become even more susceptible to the evil. So, until winter ends... I still wonder what the hype on AR. Everyone says that both the walls in this town exist for the hype on A. But the charcoal feathers are born into this world suddenly, and just as suddenly they disappear. I don't know the reason why I became a hype on A. I'm here. I can't remember anything about who I was. And if I'm to disappear someday without accomplishing anything, what's the meaning of my existence? Raka chooses to keep the frogs that Ku arranged to symbolize her and her friends, and Reki helps Raka retrieve Ku's bed. While in Raka's room, Reki seems to notice her depressed state, but tries to keep the conversation going and just ignores it. This is very indicative of how Reki constantly tries to keep her walls up. After the last episode's confrontation with Reki's past, learning about her dark secret of being sin-bound, it seems that she is completely clammed up and wants to pretend nothing happened. Then, Raka starts questioning the Haibane's existence again, and Reki realizes she can't keep pretending today is like every other day, now that Raka has this new information. You know, at one time, I felt the same way as you. I think there is a meaning, but only you can find it. To me, it feels like Reki said this because she knew it was what Raka needed to hear. Because of Reki's actions later, it does not feel like she believes this is the case at all, but, of course... At times, we all say things we think will make a situation better, even if we don't think it's true. Raka accompanies Reki out with the children, and after Reki talks about how winter is coming, Raka talks more about her dream she had in the cocoon. This is the last time we'll see it like this. Huh? We'll have snow soon. Then everything around here will be covered in pure white. As white as if we were floating in the clouds. That's why we have to get ready quickly before winter arrives. Mm. Mm. 
floating in the clouds. In my dream in the cocoon, I felt like I was in the clouds too. Your dream of falling from the sky? Mm, but you know, I don't remember what happens to me after that. Even though I think I met someone, or maybe something very important during my dream. But there are times when I can almost remember something about my dream. Then I'm afraid, as if... Hey, don't get so far ahead! I'll be by your side. I went down the wrong path because I lost Kudomori. But no matter what happens, Raka, I will always be by your side. <clears throat> what? Oh no, I told you to be careful. Didn't I tell you to walk in a straight line in the middle of the road? Reki insists she will protect Raka and be by her side. I feel like this sentiment is genuine. Reki even seems to get embarrassed about being so forward with Raka. This is important to remember, and I'll point out why later. But just keep in mind, it's overly obvious that Reki cares deeply for Raka. Raka looks up and sees two crows staring at her. She gets that feeling again, that they know her, that they want something from her. She ignores it and heads into town. At the thrift store, all the kids are getting fitted for winter wear, and Raka ends up by herself in the store. The thrift store man tells Raka to choose something for herself, obviously because he wants to cheer her up. Gotten used to the town yet? Huh? Bet you're surprised at how early winter comes around here, right? This one. Okay. Hmm. You need some shoes, too. Um, but I... You must be cold in those sandals. It's gonna be snowing soon. How about you try on these? Well, but... Ah, be my guest. A high bunny should always be in high spirits with a smile on her face. But why? Why? Well, how should I put this? Uh, since I was a kid, my mom's been telling me that the charcoal feathers are like the ones who receive blessings from above. So you're kind of like a good luck charm. No offense. <laughs> blessings? But I'm not... Uh, <laughs> uh, don't mind what I said. It's only what us simple townsfolk believe. Here. The townspeople look at High Bane as a blessing. But Raka can't possibly see herself as a blessing. She doesn't even know who she is. Lately, she's starting to feel more and more like she doesn't deserve this quiet, peaceful life she has. This calls all the way back to one of the first episodes, where Raka wonders if she truly deserves to be as happy as she is. The difference being she was content with not having the answers. She was happy and surrounded by friends who were becoming her family. But now, Ku is gone and took Raka's ability to be happy with her leaving her to blindly live in this town, being happy despite all the piling questions and doubts. Raka realizes she doesn't have enough for the boots, and the man tries to give her the boots as a gift. We get a look into how Raka really feels about herself. I don't know what happened, but things are going to get better at some point. No, they won't. I'm just a big failure as a charcoal feather. Huh? Hello. Before we get any more out of her or him, a couple enters the store, and we get to see Raka push to her breaking point. Cute! Ah! Oh! Ah! Oh! Wow! She's for real! Look! It's a little charcoal feather! We're so lucky! Something good will happen today! Leave her alone. You're bothering her. No, I'm not bothering her, right? 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 Don't 
touch me. Huh? <laughs> hey! Before I play the rest of the scene, I would like to talk about the voice acting a little bit. At the beginning of the video, I mentioned the dub and how I liked it better because of the subdued performance. I think this scene is a good example of that. What did you expect just now? If you're an anime watcher, I'm sure you expected her to yell, to exclaim, don't touch me, but she didn't. We see her flashing back to all the stress that's been building up for the last few days and it looks like she's pissed off. And then she says, Don't touch me. This difference, Raka's quiet, reserved suffering shown throughout the show is just perfect for her character. I have not watched the whole show subbed, but I've seen enough of it to know that the sub has a pretty subdued performance as well. This definitely feels like a purposeful choice to me. And I think it's one of the reasons why it's easy for me to take this show really seriously. I love anime, and the melodrama that comes with it is par for the course. Anime is not anime without at least some of the tropes that come with it, and this anime is no exception. But seeing this choice to subvert expectations and have a more subdued cast is just brilliant. Now let's go back to Raka's breakdown as she sprints away from the thrift store. That was a big fall you took, young miss. Uh, thank you. Uh, um, thank you very much. Yeah, I think you dropped this. I know that feeling all too well. If you've ever had a panic attack or bad anxiety, I think you'll be able to understand what this scene is trying to convey. The slow panic feeling that rises up inside of you before a panic attack happens, and you start to freak out, and no matter what you do, you can't stop it. The room feels like it's closing in on you, and it feels like it's suffocating you. Raka is terrified when her feathers turn black again and freaked out because she didn't know what the hell to do. No one has any real answers for her, and she doesn't know why she exists. Even though she used the medicine, the black blight sinbound thing, whatever the hell that is, keeps reappearing. It can be surmised from this scene that maybe when the high bane thinks negative thoughts or has negative emotions, it causes the black to spread. There is more evidence for this later, but this is the first real clue. Since she really had a breakdown, it's likely it caused all of the black to come back. After making it back to the field near Old Home, Raka breaks down again. I don't belong anywhere. Nowhere at all. <laughs> If I did exist at all, <laughs> these sentiments are indicative of someone who has no self worth and is extremely depressed. These characteristics are often said by suicidal people. I think if this episode didn't go exactly the way it did, realistically Raka would have been on the way to becoming suicidal. I've had those experiences, dealing with people who have literally said those things to me. So I definitely understand where the real world inspiration for this is coming from. Raka sees the crows again, and for the first time, she realizes the crows are calling to her. The crows lead Raka to the western woods, which is where Ku took her day of flight. 
Raka is hesitant to go, since she knows if you go in, you will get lost without a tether, and the bell isn't going to keep ringing this time to help her out. But she pushes on. She has to know. She has to have answers. Even if those answers are coming to her from blindly following a crow, to God knows where. In the forest, Raka comes across a well. The air here feels different, she says. At the bottom of the well, Raka sees a vaguely bird-shaped figure and decides to climb down to see what it is. It's better if I didn't exist at all. A dream I had somewhere, sometime. But now, it's so cold. I guess this well's been here for a long time. What's wrong with me? I should be afraid, but... Are you the one that called to me? You've taken the form of a bird now, but it feels like I've known you from somewhere else, a long time ago. The dead bird was someone Raka knew before, in whatever life she had before she became a Haibane. Someone who desperately wanted to protect Raka, trying in vain to save her from falling to the ground. There's a lot of symbolism in this episode pointing to Raka having someone in her life that was trying to stop her from becoming a Haibane. At times, it's referred to her leaving. So this makes me think more about how this may be a place where people who commit suicide go. There are holes in this, of course like all the Haibani children. I don't know how many children commit suicide, but having those kids there definitely makes me think twice about the suicide condition. It's also the only time it ever mentions a Haibane remembering something about their past or something in their dream trying to stop them or bring them back to wherever they came from. So this could also just be unique to Raka. Forgive me, I 
wish there was something more I could do for you. You know, I can't even remember my own name. They say the High Bunny are all like that. So I can't remember anything about who you are as much as I want to. You were somebody precious to me. I was always lonely. And I thought that nobody would ever grieve for me. Even if I was gone forever. I felt so alone. I just wanted to disappear and never feel anything again. But you were always by my side. You became a bird. Just to go over the walls and let me know that no matter how sad I felt, I was never alone. Raka realizes that all this time, she was never alone. Whoever this bird is was with her all along. Raka seems to take solace in this. Raka is saved from the bottom of the well by a couple of toga that come by. After they bring her up, they promptly leave since they are forbidden to speak to her. Uh, uh, thank you so much for rescuing me. You saved my life. Recently. She's my friend. Do you know what happened to her? Uh, I'm really sorry. I know that I'm not allowed to speak to you, but Ku is my friend, and I'm really concerned about her because I don't know anything at all about what goes on outside the town walls. Uh, is Ku doing all right? We see in this parting scene with the Toga that Raka really doesn't consider Ku dead or gone. She thinks Ku is just somewhere outside the walls. Everyone else seems to treat Ku as if she's gone forever, but still, Raka can't quite accept that or come to terms with the idea that she's truly gone. After stumbling through the forest by herself for a while, Raka comes across the wall. She thinks she can hear Ku's voice through the cracks in the walls. And because of that, she gets close and touches the wall. Because of that, she goes close and touches the wall. Afterwards, she explains that the wall is cold to the touch. She is then confronted by the High Bonnie Communicator. The High Bonnie Communicator tells Raka she must not touch the wall. He notices her sprained ankle and he starts helping her out of the woods. On the walk back, Raka starts asking questions, and we get this interesting scene. My friend, she went beyond the walls, so I thought that maybe the toga might know something about it. One more thing, I heard my friend Ku's voice from inside the walls. You only imagine that you heard what you did. It was nothing but the wall echoing your inner desire for a friend who had taken the day of flight. Only those whom the wall recognizes as ready to live outside may go beyond. Therefore, you have no need to worry. Why did you want to go down into the well? I saw that there was a dead bird at the bottom of the well. And that is what you risked your life for? It was just that... Since the day I came to this town, I've been feeling like that bird was calling out to me. I don't know how to explain it right, but I feel like I was responsible for it dying. Birds are the only creatures allowed to go beyond the walls in this world. Because of this allowance, they are said to carry that which is lost. Did you feel afraid when you saw its corpse? No. 
In that case, finding the dead bird is proof that you now know what you were supposed to. The bird was proud that it completed its task and showed you a sign that its work was over. You have no need to grieve. The High Bonnie Communicator makes it clear to Raka that she should not think that she heard Ku, and that the wall will reflect someone's inner desires back to them. I expected at this point for the High Bonnie Communicator, who seems to act as head of the High Bonnie, to say that the wall has strange powers or a spiritual connection to Ku. But instead, he actually seems to lean more into a logical explanation, which goes against the religious and spiritual themes in the show. The logical standpoint that the High Bonnie Communicator has is actually what ultimately grounds Raka. After this episode, there is something obviously changed in her, since this way of logical thinking helps her accept the loss of Ku, which takes away the mysticism and shows Raka that she is being tortured by her inner desires to see Ku, and she is able to see the futility in it. In the next scene, we see Raka's first revelation. The bird let me understand the true meaning of the dream I had in the cocoon. I had another dream at the bottom of the well. It's because the bird... bird was someone I used to know. It was someone who cared for me. I didn't even try to understand. <laughs> Why do you feel so much grief for someone you cannot even remember? I don't know, but I know I hurt them. <sighs> Please sit down. Tell me what happened and take your time. What you just said is very important. Somewhere that's not here, in a place I can't remember, I was obsessed with the idea that I was all alone. I thought that nobody would care, or even miss me if I vanished from the face of the earth. I wanted to disappear. Then I had a dream about falling from the sky. I just remembered that the bird was in the dream with me, and that the bird was someone in the form of a bird trying to call me back. I now know that I was never alone, but I... You should not think of it in such a way. Your wings and halo are proof that you have no sin to be atoned for in this world. But you don't understand. My feathers are... So, you are sin-bound, hiding the signs of your sin by dyeing your feathers with medicine. Who showed you how? <sighs> I see. What do you mean by sin-bound? Are you saying I'm a sinner? And then does that mean that the dream I had was real? There is no way to be certain. Whatever you lost dreaming inside your cocoon can never be retrieved. Even if you did hurt someone, you'll never see that person again. What should I do? This place, this town is too good to me. Everyone is so caring and treats me so kindly. I feel so guilty. If the dream I had is real, I want to go back. I have to go back. I have to apologize. <laughs> to recognize one's own sin is to have no sin. <gasps> it is the riddle of the circle of sin. Think upon it. To recognize one's own sin is to have no sin. Now I ask you, are you a sinner? Am I a sinner? If the dream I had in the cocoon was real, then I think I am a sinner. Then do you recognize your own sin? If I do, does that mean my sin will be erased? Think upon it. To recognize one's own sin is to have no sin. So, are you a sinner? Uh, but if I think I have no sin, then I become a sinner. Perhaps this is what it means to be bound by sin, to spin in the same circle looking for where the sin lies, and at some point losing sight of the way out. What's the right answer then? Think upon it. You must search for and find the answer yourself. Now come along. The High Bonnie Communicator isn't going to give Raka any answers. 
since it feels as though he has to let her come to a conclusion by herself, which ties into what Reki said earlier, that she needs to think about it and find the answers for herself, so she's left to think about the riddle the Haibani communicator gave to her. After being reunited with the group, Reki notices Raka's hands are ice cold. After learning Raka touched the wall, another tense scene begins. Over here! Hi! We're over here! <gasps> hey! That cane! Oh, the old communicator let me borrow it for a while. I know he seems scary, but he's really nice. If he was a truly nice man, he would not have left an injured girl all by herself. <gasps> oh no, look at your hands! <gasps> They're cold! This could mean that you're really sick. You feel like ice. That's strange. I don't feel like anything's wrong. Hey, my ankle doesn't hurt anymore. It hasn't gotten better. You've gone numb. Can you walk? Hmm. While you were out there, did you touch the wall? Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh? What's wrong? You look so pale. I have to take Raka home right now. Let's go. Oh. Hey, wait! She said she touched the wall. What? <laughs> Raka, get on. Hey, what happened? Reki, tell me what happened. Wait! Reki has obviously seen this before and is terrified. After rushing home, Reki insists that after midnight, Raka will develop a fever. Hikari demands to know, but Reki refuses to talk about how she knows so much. Reki realizes that all of Raka's dark spots are gone and mentions how there's no way it was just the medicine that could have done it. Raka has broken her cycle of sin, either because of her being able to forgive herself and move on after encountering the bird at the well, or because of the riddle the high body communicator gave her. Reki continues to sweetly care for Raka. It's honestly a very touching scene when Reki just sits with Raka and assures her everything is going to be okay. The scene displays how much Raka's view has changed in such a short time. In the last episode, Raka wanted to disappear. And now... I don't want to go anywhere else. That's okay, isn't it? Of course. You can stay here for as long as you like. After all, you are a blessed Haibane. Raki, you've always been helping me. You're free. And now I'm alone. After that, Reki goes off to her room, and we finally get some insight into her psychological state. You know, Raka doesn't really need my help either. <sighs> There's no need to be depressed. I should be happy. Raka isn't sin-bound anymore. I've gotten used to being abandoned. I mean, after all, it's happened so many times over the past seven years. Reki feels alone. She feels abandoned by Raka recovering from being sin-bound. Logical? No, it's not. But that's the point. Reki says she's been hurt so many times over the last couple years, which is why she feels this way. She knows she should be happy for Raka, and she continues to pretend to be. But alone with her true feelings, we get to see that she feels abandoned. She felt a connection between the two of them being the only sin-bound Haibane. And despite her having a friendship with Raka and the others, it doesn't feel like the same kind of connection because Reki doesn't let anyone into her true self. 
The closest she's ever come to that is sharing her sin-bound curse with Raka. And now that it's gone, she feels like she is truly alone again. A lot of Reki's suffering is brought upon herself, not only shown here with her unwillingness to form real connections, but also because of some points I'll explain later on. This episode tells Reki's backstory. We open on a newborn Haibane and a young Nemu running to get some help. The older woman is the lady Reki was talking about who took her day of flight. At any rate, why don't we at least try to clean up the room? Anybody who was born in a room full of junk like this, I'd feel sorry for. Next up is a montage of how Reki is ostracized by the other Haibane for being different. She didn't have many friends, and at first Nemu was really cruel to her. I think it's really interesting how they kept this dynamic between Nemu and Reki. They're always bickering and picking on each other, which tells us that they have an interesting past together. Nemu has come to love Reki and deeply cares for her as a friend, but the evolution is really cool to watch. We see that much like Raka, Reki also tried to cut off her black feathers it gives a new weight to that scene earlier, where she gave Raka that knowing look as she tried to cut her feathers. I'll always, always be by your side. No, I think it might be too big for me. Well then, why don't we make this a guest room? You can live here and take care of the newborn Hibane. That can be your new job. Really? That sounds great. And you can take care of the kids when you have free time. <laughs> I swear I'll do my best. Now you're a full-fledged Hibane. <laughs> <laughs> Kuramori, please don't go. You said you'd be by my side. You promised me. Brought back from her reminiscing by the realization that she forgot about Raka, she rushes to see how she's doing. Kana says her fever won't come down, but Reki decides to take matters into her own hands. She goes to the Haibani communicator and demands to know why he left her knowing full well she would get a fever. <laughs> Go ahead. How could you leave her alone like that? You knew that if she touched the wall, she would develop a fever. Because you're in old home, I suspected that should something ever happen to her, you would come here, as you had for Hyoko. We're not talking about Hyoko. You have to cure Raka. It's not like she was climbing the walls. Why do this to her? The walls are absolute. There is nothing within my power to do for her. The walls are supposed to protect good Haibane, aren't they? And Raka isn't sin-bound anymore, is she? Even a good Haibane must be punished if she touches the wall. Raka did overcome her ordeal. However... So it's true, she really did it. She had a bird help her, and there is no question that eventually she will find a way to break out of the circle of sin. <gasps> then you mean, you gave Raka and I the same riddle? So then, did she find an answer? I know not. However, the bird gave her forgiveness, and therefore she is no longer sin-bound. Oh. Only a little time remains for you to stay here as a Haibane. 
you need to prepare yourself mentally. The day of flight never comes to the Sinbound, right? I'm fine staying here. Besides, I need to stay and watch the kids. That is not for you to decide. You know what becomes of a Haibane whose time expires before she becomes ready to take the flight. <laughs> you have no choice but to prevail against your own ordeal. As you well know, the day of flight comes equally to all good Haibane. What do you mean, equally? Ku was the youngest of us all. And yet, she was not afraid of the walls. She believed that if she went beyond the walls, the rest of you would soon follow. It was Ku's dream to become a role model to all of you. How do you know that? I know nothing. I am merely giving voice to the thoughts that you have deep in your mind. How about Nemu? She's always been a good Haibane. Nemu deserves to take the day of flight with your blessings. Nemu wishes to see you take the flight first. She never voices it, but she is more concerned for you than for herself. She is? Then are you saying I'm a burden on her? No, that's not true. Nemu's issues are not your responsibility. That is simply how it is for her. Now go. <laughs> Raka is awaiting you. Help yourself and pick the medicinal herbs you need. I trust you know which ones. You have always been there for Raka. You always do the right thing. And now you must not be envious of Raka for moving forward. Be envious? Me envious? You must be out of your mind! This scene is very telling about all of the characters. The high body communicator can read their inner desires, whether that is because he has some sort of divine knowledge or powers, or just pays attention we aren't ever given the answer to. But despite that, we get a lot of insight into how the other characters feel. Reki insists she isn't envious of Raka, even though she is. Reki doesn't want to admit to herself just how jealous she feels of Raka finding redemption after searching for over seven years for her own. Despite her true feelings, Reki still helps Raka to the best of her ability, showing that at the very least, she will always put others above herself. The next day, Reki is livid to find that the High Bonnie Renme has insisted that Raka come to the temple for her punishment. And the episode ends with Raka showing she has fully healed from her ordeal and thanking Reki for all her help. Upon entering the temple, the High Bonnie communicator leads Raka down a great staircase and shows her what her punishment will be for touching the wall. I find the atmosphere of the scene to be otherworldly and beautiful. This way. You may use your voice here if you wish. Does this mean I'm gonna be put in prison? Prison? Because I... <laughs> Where are we? Inside the wall. The wall? Look over here. <gasps> These are called light leaves. These are what your halos are made of. You are to circle this corridor and gather the leaves. You must also purify the rusted tags. That will be your job in this town. It is an important task. Can you do it? You mean by myself? Are you frightened? Do it. I will come to collect you later. And remember, you must never take off your robe. 
Do not be frightened of anything you may see or hear. Regardless of what it is, it cannot touch one who is wearing the robe. Uh, you're saying something lives here? Wait, what? He left so fast, that part always makes me laugh. He's like, okay, you may get attacked, or something vague, I don't know. But keep on your robe and you'll be fine. Have fun by yourself. The rest of the episode focuses on Shoko and pals giving a gift to Reki to give to Raka, since he feels bad about upsetting her the other day. This spurs on the following events, visiting the other Haibani nest at Abandoned Factory. The final scene is between Nemu and Reki. Reki tells Nemu she doesn't want to be a burden to her anymore, but runs off before explaining why she feels this way. We learn that at Abandoned Factory, the other Haibane don't have the resources to take care of the Young Feathers, so any Haibane born there that are in the Young Feathers group live at Old Home, and visit Abandoned Factory once or twice a year. Raka volunteers to take a Young Feather there, so she can also return a gift back to them. The Haibane in Abandoned Factory are all more laid back and seemingly a little more delinquent than the ones in Old Home. It's co-ed, so already there's a lot of rowdy boys and they seem to pass the time by skateboarding around the town, playing harmless pranks, and messing around with firecrackers. The girl Haibane there all gossip a lot about Reki and the trouble that happened between all of them, of course, making Raka more curious about the situation. On the way back to Old Home, one of the abandoned factory Haibane, named Midori, catches up with Raka and starts asking her questions. She's always such a little do-gooder, isn't she? So tell me, what do you know about us? Uh, uh, well, I saw... I saw you guys and Reki arguing over here before. What else? And I also heard that Reki and Hyoko of Abandoned Factory tried to... <laughs> huh? run away together, right? Give me a break. Isn't it true? Reki and Hyoko were kind of together. But Hyoko was a victim of Reki's selfishness. You know, he almost died because of her. Reki... Reki wouldn't do such horrible things. <sighs> you know nothing about what Reki's capable of doing. Nothing. Reki would never hurt anyone. Very mysterious. Moving on for now, Raka is back in the walls, doing her little cleaning collection job when her airheadedness causes her to lose hold of the boat, which causes her to go to a new portion of the wall she's never been to before, where she has an interesting experience.
Is this still just the wall showing Raka what she wants to see? The Haibani communicator told Raka that anything she sees or hears in or near the walls is just the walls echoing her inner thoughts and desires. But to me, this all seems too convenient. There's too much mystical stuff going on for me to believe that this seemingly paranormal experience was just the walls messing with Raka for no reason. I think the Haibani communicator knows everything, but he isn't allowed to tell the other Haibani the truth because it would mess with whatever process they're supposed to be doing themselves, which seems to be very important if they are to ever take their day of flight. I think this is also why he tells the Haibane that the walls are just reflecting what they want to see. If the Haibane were given all the answers and didn't have to come to any conclusions by themselves, there's a good chance that it would mean many of them wouldn't be able to come to terms with it. If you think about it, it's much easier to accept something when you come to the conclusion yourself than it is when someone tells you the answer. Individuals are much more willing to accept bad things about themselves when they realize it than if someone tells them about their flaws. Also, the shock of learning the truth would probably cause many high bonnet to break down, being unable to come to terms with whatever the shocking truth is. Reki has been acting a little nervous lately. The fact that her day of flight has not arrived is weighing heavily on her mind. And yet she silently hopes that it will never come. I know, it hurts me a lot to see her suffering like this, but I still don't want her to go away. She is still lost in the dark. Raka, you had the bird come to you enabling you to fill in the missing pieces of your memories. However, Reki has no one. She must face the darkness on her own. It is a trying ordeal. Reki keeps painting the scenes from her dream in the cocoon. I saw her paintings once, but I couldn't tell what they were. I don't think Reki knows either. There is not much time left for Reki. I know not how or when, but by the end of this winter, her journey will have come to a conclusion. If Reki is still in darkness by that point, she will be bound to this place forever. Is it possible for Haibane to remain here? It is quite rare, but some do remain. However, they are no longer called Haibane. They lose their wings and halos, and must live far away from both humans and Haibane. And with time, they will grow old and die. It is a quiet and peaceful, but lonely life. I, or rather the Haibane Renmei, wishes for all Haibane to take flight without problem. But as it is, Reki refuses me. Everything I say makes Reki close her mind to help her. She was suffering inside all this time, but she hid her pain and helped me. So this time, no matter what, I have to help her. In order to save Reki, it will mean parting with her. If she leaves here, I think it's very likely that you will never see her again. Are you prepared to pay that price? Reki must overcome her ordeal on her own before the festival ends, or she will never be able to take her day of flight. It is not stated if that is because of the age she has reached as a Haibane, but I would say it's safe to assume a Haibane can't move on once they have totally given up, unable to reach the revelation that makes them able to move on from this world. Since there seems to be no age a Haibane will be born or take the day of flight, we can assume that everyone's time here is different and takes a different amount of time to complete. Somehow, the communicator knows this, which lends more evidence to him being in touch with some higher power or being. Raka is now aware of just how much suffering Reki has gone through, and she is determined to help her. But she isn't sure how. While at the library the next day, Raka speaks with Nemu's co-worker again and they have an important revelation about some of the petrified books. 
While looking at the strange markings, they come to think the markings look kind of like hands. On the way home, Raka runs into Reki, and we get to hear some of her internal monologue as she walks with her. Wow, you've never used peaches? Well, don't worry. I was just joking that they would make a good get well gift. Oh, really? <laughs> we walk with empty smiles plastered on our faces. Reki is always kind. She doesn't want to worry anyone, and she doesn't want to lean on anyone. So she smiles. Why didn't I realize that sooner? I was always right next to her. Why couldn't I see it? I wish tomorrow would never come. What? That was sudden. I wish the day after today was today, and the next day, and the next day too. I wish it was always today, and I'd be able to be with you, forever. There is no such thing as forever. <gasps> Sooner or later, everything ends, just like it should. <gasps> because now, is only meant to be now. And this moment is so precious. Yeah, that makes sense. Guess you're right. We don't get to see the look on Reki's face as she makes that remark. But I believe if we could, it would be the face of someone who has completely given up. After pretty much being shut down by Reki's nonchalant life in the moment attitude towards Raka's attempt to help Reki feel loved and not alone, Raka runs off feeling very much a failure in helping her friend find peace. Reki returns home where we get another important scene. Nemu, thanks for everything over these years. If you see Kurumori someday, tell her that I'm sorry and that I said thanks. I don't think I'm ever gonna make it to whatever world she's in. Now, it's time for me to end it. The group goes into town to buy bell nuts these little colored nuts that are used to celebrate the new year, and you give different colors to people to mean different things. While in town, Reki meets with Shoko again. Uh. <laughs> Stop being so... Reki. What do you want? It's nothing. If you have something to say to me, then why don't you just say it? I'm sorry for causing you all so much trouble and dragging the both of you into my personal problems. I was just really alone. Reki. The festival's not till next week. I don't have much time, and I might not see you again. Reki can sense her time is coming, and she tries her best in the state that she's in to mend her broken bonds. In the next scene, we finally learn what happened to Reki all those years ago. 
I first saw her five years ago. It was raining. Her wings were all black. She was crying as she walked, all soaking wet. She looked just like an abandoned cat. Right then, I knew that I had to help her. Oh, you've got to be kidding. Oh, shut up! Anyway, that's the story. That was the day when Reki became one of us. And then she left, taking you with her. Back then, she was always crying, missing her friend who'd gone beyond the walls. So, I tried to do something for her. And this idiot took Reki and tried to climb over the wall by driving a wedge into it. We didn't think that he would survive. Reki didn't even have a single scratch, and I will never forgive her for that. It wasn't her fault. I did it on my own. Reki is still selfish. You were one of her best friends. Why don't you shut up? Shoko touched the wall and not only fell and hurt himself, but also came down with a terrible fever just as Raka had when she broke the rules. In all the years that followed, they were never able to fix the bonds broken between everyone. And that is why Old Home and Abandoned Factory both have high bonne, but they live completely separate lives. It's obvious Shoko still deeply cares for Reki, but those around him have seemingly kept them apart in the fear something like this would happen again. In the rest of this scene, we get one of the strangest editing choices I've ever seen. Why don't you shut up? I have to. I want to help Reki so that she can receive the blessing properly. You'll just get in the way. Reki's not the kind of person who asks for others' help. <sighs> You're wrong! <laughs> that will always make me chuckle. And this next part has the best line in the whole show. I'll help. After all, I have to pay her back for the gift. Idiot! You aren't allowed to enter the South District, remember? Don't you worry about me. I got a brain. What brain? Quit smoking, you stupid girl! Stop riding that bike! While back in the walls, Raka finally puts together the revelation she had in the library with the plaques on the walls. The signs on the walls are hand signs. After blowing the communicator's mind with her new mad skills, we learn what the names inside the walls mean. Where did you learn that? I permit you to speak. I felt Ku's presence near the sign that produces light leaves. It's Ku's sign, isn't it? But its letters do not mean the word air, the name given by the Hibane. It's a different name with the same sound. Ku has a different name? It is proof that the Hibane attained a true identity. When the time comes, the name on the sign hanging from the wall is changed to the true name. Yes, now may be a good opportunity. We created this, using the tag on the wall as a model. Can you tell me where that name came from? It's because I isolated myself inside a shell like a nut. And because you sprouted here and connected with others. Therefore, it will be your true name. Uh, but what about Reki? She does not know her true name. She is not willing to listen to my words. Why not? Five years ago, she brought to us a Hibane boy who had fallen ill. I know. He tried to climb the wall by driving a wedge into it. A serious crime. I had to call for the community watch. Reki was deemed guilty, and she shut herself inside the circle of sin. 
She's been blaming herself all this time. Why is it only Reki who can't be forgiven? Why do you think you were forgiven? It's not because I forgave myself. That is correct. Nobody is able to forgive themselves. However, you had the bird. Someone believed in you and stood by you. By recognizing one's own sin, you can't help but go around in circles if you're alone. But if you have someone that's by your side... Give this to Reki after the festival. Now go. Before I address anything else, let me just say, I think Reki was destined to remain sin-bound no matter what. Of course, she came out of her cocoon sin-bound, and even if this stuff with Shoko had not happened, she probably would have just stayed miserable because of her other issues. But also, we get an interesting statement here. You can't forgive yourself for your own sin. For a while, I thought this seemed like a paradox, especially since up until this point, the show has seemed like a sort of forgive yourself so you can be happy kind of deal. But I think I understand now. Imagine you did something horrible. You killed someone by accident. Now imagine you will never see anyone else ever again and no one will ever know. Are you entitled to forgiveness from that act if you forgive yourself? Or would you need some outside force to forgive you? If no one ever knows what you did, how can you be forgiven for your sin? If you forgive yourself, it's likely you're just doing it to make yourself feel better. We're always biased in our own favor, and thus, forgiving yourself is a paradox. A friend of mine also had a good point she told me while helping me edit the script. She said, I sometimes feel that with certain mistakes in life, no matter who forgives you for what you did, it doesn't make you feel any better. Because sometimes you can be very angry at yourself for a long time. And I think forgiving yourself can release whatever turmoil you hold against yourself. Kind of like messing up in life and being mad at yourself for it. Because you can see where you went wrong. I agree with this stance as well, and I think it's important to keep this in mind when trying to figure out the whole circle of sin dilemma. I do think this is meant to be confusing and lead back to itself. After all, it is referred to as the circle of sin. It is meant to be a hard thing to answer for yourself, and your answer to this may be different than mine. But I think you can forgive yourself for things you've done and feel better, but that does not erase the sin and it does not forgive you in the eyes of others. In this sense, perhaps, the others is a godlike entity or the people the High Bonnet have left behind. Reki insists she will not go to the festival, choosing to stay home and think about her memories. At this point, Reki is not even trying to cover up knowing she will be leaving soon, and we get this touching, if not one-sided scene between her and Raka. I can etch the memories of my life here into my mind. Mm. When I looked out from here for the first time, mm -hmm. I was a little afraid, thinking that I came to a world I didn't know. But now, this is where I feel most secure. Because you are always here. Thank you. And even if you forget about me, I hope that you will always remember this view. I won't forget! There's no way I can forget, because the time I spent with you is everything I remember. Raka accompanies the others into town to celebrate the festival. There's a beautiful scene of all the Haibane showing their love and appreciation for their friends, employers, and neighbors giving nuts to everyone who helped them throughout the year. This scene almost makes me cry every time. It gives me this beautiful, cathartic feeling, especially in the midst of all the stressful things going on in the show at this point.
We now see Raka at abandoned factory, where we learn Midori and the other Haibane are finally ready to talk with Reki. After learning that Reki didn't come to town, Midori and Raka run off to find her, hoping they make sure she will see all the work they put into their surprise for her. Where's Reki's room? West wing, third floor. We won't make it in time. Reki! Reki, I came to see you! Open your window! Reki! Huh? Well done. Raka? Midori, what's wrong? We'll explain later. Look towards abandoned factory. Hmm? Yoko and I. I've been acting like an idiot. That's true. Goodbye. And thank you, Reki. Midori and Shoko forgive Reki. After gathering with the others, they tell Raka there's one more surprise in store. The bell stopped. So ends the year. That's right. So what happens now? <laughs> the walls send the thoughts they've been receiving from everyone over the past year into the sky. The thoughts? You just listen for it. Uh...
I don't exactly have the information to back up this claim, but I think the walls are sentient, or they have a sentient being controlling them. I can't imagine what other explanation there could be for the walls choosing to do these certain things. After everyone falls asleep together, Raka wakes up to Reki sneaking out of the room. Following Reki to her room, we see that her art studio and bedroom are deserted. All of Reki's things are packed away in boxes. Raka looks to the other door in Reki's room, the door Reki wouldn't let anyone near. Upon entering this door, Raka is greeted with a surprising sight. On the walls are paintings of what we can assume are Reki's nightmares. A red moon a dark landscape, and what appears to be a railroad. We see Reki standing in the corner, again using the angel in front of the window symbol, this time having the window be boarded up, not allowing any light to enter. No doubt this is supposed to reflect Reki's mental state. Raka, what are you doing here? I'm really sorry. I let myself in. <laughs> Look at you. You'll be Raka to the very end. Reki, what? This is my cocoon dream. The nightmare that has been tormenting my existence in this world. I was walking along this path. I remember cold wind stinging my cheeks that were wet from tears. I heard a sound from far away. But I was too tired to think. I remember wanting to become a stone. A stone that doesn't feel pain. Or sorrow. The Haibane Renmei want me to give this to you. It's your true name. I don't want it. There's no salvation for me. Inside that box. Reki, even if that's true, it's time for you to put an end to this long nightmare of yours. This is the story of a young girl who was called Reki. She, she was, was doomed, doomed to a most, most unfortunate, unfortunate fate, fate and, and lost, lost the people, people she could share her about. sorrow with. Believing herself worthless, she called herself Reki, using the sign which meant small stones. However, the sign that expresses her true name means the one who was run over and torn asunder. Reki? who was run over and torn asunder. Yes, I was run over. This isn't a path. It's an iron line that carries something. This is where I abandoned myself. Reki, what can I... You know, Raka, I believed that if I was a good Hibane, I would someday be able to wake up and shed this feeling of guilt. What a joke. None of that matters. This town is my prison. The walls are a symbol of my death. This world is separated by death. And this room! This room is my cocoon. I wasn't able to leave this nightmare behind for seven long years. 
I kept waiting for a deliverance that would never come. One who was run over and torn asunder. I think this being Reki's true name has a double meaning. Literally her being run over by a train, perhaps she committed suicide by letting a train hit her, and being run over emotionally by being left behind so many times. Upon realizing what this means, Reki starts having a breakdown. Her feathers rapidly grow black, and this makes me think that the circle of sin or being sin-bound haibane is what happens when an individual can't accept what happened to them or can't move on. Earlier in the show, Reki talks about how Raka needs to find closure about Ku's death. It's ironic and realistic to think someone can see the flaws in others but can't see the flaws in themselves. Until this moment, Reki has been tormented by not knowing why she is sin-bound. She's tried so hard to be what she thinks a good haibane is, only to have things thrown back in her face over and over, and now we get to see the culmination of all of that suppressed emotion brought to life. Every time I trusted someone, I ended up being betrayed. So finally, I stopped trusting everybody. I decided I would never be hurt again. I decided to be made of stone. <laughs> that's the irony of it. When I turn to stone and pretend to be good, that's when they tell me I'm a good little Hibane. They'll never know how very dark and very cold my heart is. All right, I know, I know. Super edgy. But what she's saying is very relatable. Reki's struggle and her personal guilt that she can't get past is what really drew me into the show. To me, personally, I can imagine what it feels like. So many of us have been in that place, feeling like every time you get close to someone, you just get shut down, or feeling like you have no one to turn to because every person in your life has failed you over and over again. And so you just try to stop feeling. We now see a perfect example of someone trying their hardest to push someone away as a defense mechanism. Stop! There's no way I can believe that. You've always been so kind. Raka. <sighs> I guess you never really understood. You never saw how jealous I was of you. No. Both of us sinbound. But in the end, only you were forgiven. Everyone leaves me eventually. When Ku took her day of flight, Part of me was jealous of her. And I hate myself for it. That's not true! You came looking for me when I fell into the well. You took care of me and went to get medicine for me. Whenever I was in pain, you were always there for me! That's right! And why'd I do it? <gasps> I was looking for my salvation. I can only forget about my sin when I'm being useful to someone. And the only thought that I had the whole time I was helping you was that maybe God would come down and finally forgive me. Stop it! Stop it! <laughs> Raka, for what I needed, you could have been anybody. Stop it! When I first found your cocoon, at that moment I had a plan. I told myself that if I could make this one hibernate trust me, then maybe I would finally be forgiven. It never mattered who came out of the cocoon. It was all part of my plan. Why do you think I acted so kindly towards you? It was all a lie. I don't care what I do as long as I find forgiveness. It was your mistake trusting me. 
and now you know. So get out! Get out! From the very beginning, there was no salvation for me. <laughs> not true. It's not true. <laughs> Looking at all of this from Raka's perspective, all she knows is love and friendship. She has no memories other than the ones we've seen her make in the show. And if you haven't noticed, no one in the show is cruel to each other. This show is not about conflict between characters, it's about characters having conflicts within themselves. This is the first time Raka is experiencing betrayal, and the first time Raka is experiencing any sort of confrontation with the person at all. Knowing this gives this scene a whole new light for me. Not only does it make me feel horrible for Raka, but it shows just how deep Reki's issues have gone. She was once just as innocent as Raka, but her struggles and failures have molded her into this angry, confused person who can't find solace in even her friends. If you've never been in this emotional place, it may seem confusing to you why someone would act this way. It's obvious to anyone who paid attention to Raka and Reki's relationship that none of what Reki said is true. When people are at their lowest, oftentimes they'll lash out and hurt the ones they love most. Why? It's hard to answer that question. I got some more interesting insight about this question from one of my script editors. They said, I feel like it might be because we've known them for so long, and we feel comfortable expressing our true emotions. And it's almost like an emotional release that we might not be able to get from letting it out to a stranger. Almost like a scapegoat. But that doesn't make it right either. I've been where Reki is. I've lashed out and said things I didn't mean because I wanted to drive people away, and I've also been on the receiving end of that. I think the only way I can describe it is I felt so horrible that I didn't even want to let myself have any solace. I didn't want a friend to make it better. In a way, I felt like I deserved to suffer. I think it's likely Reki feels this way too. Self-deprecation self-hate. These are the things that drive people to these points. After Raka has a breakdown of her own, we see Reki has started hallucinating inside the room. From the very beginning, there was no salvation for me. Once the sound catches up with me, I'm going to disappear forever, right? You know that Raka was trying to help you. Maybe I don't deserve anyone's help. <laughs> but why? Why don't I ever get to ask for help? <gasps> Stop it! Why are you so afraid? Just trust someone. I won't ever be betrayed by anyone again. In my dream, in this town, and anywhere. No matter what I do, no one ever comes to save me. But you never actually ask anyone for help. You just wait and wait. <gasps> I can't do it! What if I call for help and nobody answers? What if I really am completely alone?
The intense fear of being alone, calling for help only for no one to answer. I think we can all relate to that. Reki feels she has no one to save her. Outside the room, Raka is having a breakdown of her own, and by pure luck or divine intervention, Raka finds Reki's diary. And it has lots of drawings of old home and things that have happened throughout the show. And then Raka finds entries that talk about her. I want to keep trusting Reki, but I... But I... <gasps> Her diary... I found a cocoon all by myself. I'm so happy. This must be a special sign from God. I will be kind to her and always be by her side. This time, I will be a good Haibane, like Kuromori. That's right, Reki, when I was in the cocoon. Can you hear me? My name is Reki. This is the first time I've ever found a cocoon, so I'm real happy and excited. As a Haibane, you're going to forget who you were. So maybe at first, you're going to feel scared and lonely. But don't worry about it, because I will always be with you. I will protect you. So please, I'm trusting you to help me, because you are my last hope. I understand. She protected me. She protected me from the very beginning. Reki. I have to be the bird who will save Reki. Just like the bird who saved me. Reki didn't really use Raka. Her heart was in the right place. And although she was right about wanting Raka to be the one to give Reki her salvation, it's obvious that Reki's intentions were pure. After this revelation, Raka realizes she has to save Reki, just like the bird who saved her. As Raka re-enters the nightmare room, we see that by magic or something, the room has been transformed into a real place. Reki lays face down on the tracks, and Raka is frantically trying to reach her, only to find Reki's younger self holding her back. Let go! Reki can't hear you anymore. Why not? Reki! Reki! This is where Reki has chosen to disappear. <sighs> no! Reki asked me to help save her from this! Reki! Reki! Just call my name! Please say that you need me! Please help me.
Does this mean that I'm finally forgiven? Reki was able to cast away her sin by reaching out and trusting Raka. This either implies that Reki's ordeal was her own selfishness and self-hate, making her unable to get past her hang-ups, or that all she needed all along was to feel like she wasn't alone. Reki is now finally able to take her day of flight. Strange. I saw this break. Uh, look at the name. If a bird brings you your salvation, the name Reki will disappear, and the Reki that is stone will become your true name. Believing this will come to pass, I now introduce a new story of the Reki that is stone. Reki, will we see each other again? Well, yeah, I think we will. I believe we will too. Now close your eyes. Huh? <laughs> It's the custom for a Hibane to disappear without notice when the day of flight comes. <laughs> Reki will be Reki to the very end, right? She freed herself from her curse by walking a difficult path and by being kind to the weak. At first, this was merely pretense in order to attain salvation, and yet in time it became her nature. There is an ancient staircase that serves as a stepping stone for the Hibane when they take their day of flight. Reki is that stepping stone, the one who guides the weak. So she's gone then. I'm glad. But it was for the best, right? Yes, she received the blessing. The western sky is quite something. Don't you want to come see? No thanks. Besides, I already got Reki's reply. If you say so. Want some cake? Nah, it's sweet, right? It's lemon souffle. Reki made it. Huh? I already said no. How can you be so stupid? <sighs> Do you know what color a lemon is? Oh. That evening, all of us went into the woods together. Apparently everyone knew it was going to happen, so all of us were able to say goodbye with a smile. After praying in the chapel, we returned to Old Home and had dinner at the table which we set with one empty chair. Reki left many paintings behind for us. I was relieved to know that, aside from paintings of her dark dream, she was able to produce many bright and beautiful works. Those paintings told me how much Reki truly loved this town and old home, and that she truly cared for everyone she knew and lived with. After this, the final scene is of Raka finding two new cocoons and running off exclaiming how excited she is for the new Haibane. Before I state my final conclusion, I feel it is important to go over fan theories that differ a lot from mine. The first popular theory I found is that the Haibane are here in this town as a punishment, as a sort of purgatory because they killed themselves. Reki threw herself in front of a train, Nemu took sleeping pills, etc. I threw away this theory because of things like there being children haibane, but the people who like this theory explain that by saying the children could be children who were killed in things like abortions or car accidents, and are reborn as haibane because they've died and haven't yet fulfilled their purpose, so have been given another chance to grow old. Another one is that the Haibane are in this town to learn a lesson and then move on. 
and that there is nothing beyond the walls, it's literally nothingness. And the toga are beings that live in the nothingness, which could be the realm of the dead. This theorist stated, Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying the toga are nothing but wandering dreams, I'm saying that the town lies in between the realm of the living and the realm of the dead. I believe it is a passing point where some spirits get a second chance at life before death, and where others find their path back to life. I will link to where I found these theories in the description. I think both of these theories could be just as correct as the conclusion that I have come to. That's the beauty of this being a show that can be interpreted in so many ways. So now, after all of that, I'm going to try and sum up what I think is going on in this series. Haibane are people who have died and met some sort of requirement to get accepted into the town of Guri. This town seems to be a physical place where normal humans live too. As a Haibane, you lose all of your memories except for the dream you have while in your cocoon. Once you're born, the other Haibane bestows you with a halo, which seems to only have the purpose of being a traditionally worn item because if it has any other significance, it is never stated. Not long after you're born, you grow wings. The wings also seem to have no significance other than to signify this person is a Haibane. After that, you're just supposed to live a nice life. This town seems to be a haven for those who need a place to feel safe and loved. Everyone in the town is nice to Haibane, and they are never expected to face any hardship. There are even systems in place, such as how every Haibane is expected to work, so that the Haibane never feel like they're a burden. These sorts of safeguards are put in place to prevent the Haibane from feeling negative feelings, so they have less of a chance to become sin-bound. Haibane are meant to find fulfillment here, that they never could in life. When Ku speaks to Raka before her day of flight, she says inside her mind she has a beautiful cup that is filled with drops every day and that it's finally filled. This is a depiction of Ku's literal fulfillment. Finding happiness and contentment is the Haibane's number one goal. This would explain why there are so many young feathers. A child that dies too soon would be a perfect candidate for this afterlife where they get to play and be happy like they weren't allowed to in life, because their time was cut short. Really, all the Haibane are born pretty young. This makes sense because, of course, an adult or older person who dies wouldn't likely have the same unfinished business. The day of flight is either the Haibane moving on to an afterlife, or just leaving this world feeling like they don't have any unfinished business left. Along the way, if a Haibane is unable to accept their new way of life, or they can't let go of their fears and resentments, they become sin-bound. If one cannot break the circle of sin and have the day of flight, eventually they lose their wings and halos and are forced to become toga. They live outside the walls and only come and go to bring goods and food to the townsfolk. Of course, the Haibane communicator was once a Haibane too. It is implied that the life of the Haibane that can't pass on is a peaceful one but a lonely one. So it is not so much a punishment as just a sadder alternative for them. The walls are connected to a higher power or deity, whatever it is that is in charge of the Haibane, and communicates with the Haibane communicator. They have strict rules that bend to no one, but they also seem to be benign. They are not an evil force or a spiteful one, the walls have a connection with the Haibane that allows them to know their inner thoughts and desires. Because of this connection, they reflect it back to them. Ultimately, the Haibane are meant to live happy, peaceful lives, and for the most part, they do. The end of the show alludes to that peacefulness. Life will go on for Raka and the other Haibane until they too find fulfillment and take their day of flight. After watching this show five times, reading online theories, and watching interviews with the creator, I think I've gotten pretty close to what is supposed to be going on. Of course, one of the points of Haibani Renmei is that the experience is supposed to tailor to the watcher at least a little bit. Any piece of art that is left up to interpretation can be taken in many different ways. And that's not good or bad, just 
different. If you have any details you think I missed or interpreted differently than you, please let me know in the comments. I want to start a conversation with you all and see what you think about my analysis. I didn't have a lot of outside help with this, and almost everything I said was all just me watching the show and writing down my thoughts. Ultimately, we are left with one powerful and sobering question that lies at the heart of Hai Bane Renmei. And to ask it to you all means being open and vulnerable again, one last time. When we die, what becomes of us? Loss has been an integral part of my life, and it helps shape me into who I am today. It continues to shape me, as all grief and loss does to a person, long after the ripples that they left have faded. Perhaps that's why I gravitated to Haibani Renmei to such a degree, both before, during, and after experiencing such losses. It offers an idea that when we are finished in this world, there's a chance we can be repurposed and offered another tumultuous shot at this whole life business, but with the foresight necessary to figure out how to accomplish our goal. It is an allegory for the struggles both the person dying goes through as they transition to whatever the hell is next, and that of the people they love whom they've left behind. It is not meant to be fully understood, and not every theory can be extrapolated upon. Some are just a gut feeling, kind of like the faith we put in humanity, where perhaps religion and spirituality falters for those of us not religiously inclined. We don't know what will come next, and nobody has ever been able to successfully come back and definitively tell us. All we have is interpretations, and, most critically, belief. It is that belief that carries us to greater things, to make something that will inspire others to create a complex story about these angelic figures and the afterlife that leads to this video, that leads to all of you, sat there patiently watching for the grand reveal of what this all means. But I can't give you a definitive one. There is no singular theory or grand design. It's all up to you to find your own path, your own interpretation. I believe everyone has a thing that they fixated on upon times of extreme hardship. Some go for an album, others go to a video game, and more still to a belief system. But mine? Mine was, and always will be, Haibane Renmei. Thank you so much for watching, everyone. I would like to extend my thanks to my wonderful friends Dexter, Radio Stories Now, and TJ Lee for helping me edit this script, as well as giving me valuable insight on several of the major points in the script. I hope that you all enjoyed.